Hello everyone. As we all know that there is a huge number of users who are using Linux nowadays, but very few of them know that how they can perform administrative tasks using Linux distributions. Well, do not worry. I have just designed a course in which I'll tell you everything that is related to Linux administration. So get yourself enrolled now and you will learn from Linux installation to almost everything that you can perform in terms of the administration with the Linux distributions. So I'll see you in the class. In the first section, we'll talk about Linux overview and its installation. And in the first video of this section, we'll talk about Linux distribution, their history and features. While Linux is an open source operating system, having a kernel that acts as the central unit, just like the CPU for Windows operating system for establishing the communication between the hardware and the system software in a computer. By open source, we mean that you can use the base structure of Linux and develop your customized Linux distribution as per your need or requirements. For the time being, we saw many changes in the Linux distributions if we talk about the earlier nature of Linux distributions, Linux was designed to provide users with a customizable system that they can alter as per their needs. And in initial designs and versions of Linux, only those things were included in Linux systems that were essential for any operating system. With time passing by, we saw more things getting started to be added to Linux distributions. For example, Games were not even in consideration during the initial phase of Linux development and deployment. But now, we see many games available for Linux-based operating systems. Now we also see multimedia applications which were not there in the earlier versions of Linux. Now let's talk about some of the core features that Linux operating systems has to offer. Well, they are open source. Linux is secure. It is considered best for older computers, allows the customizations, and it is free to use, has large community support and privacy. While Linux ensures the privacy of users' data, as it never collects much data from the user while using its distribution or software, but this is not true for many other operating systems, and this is the beauty of Linux as well. Let's talk about why do we have so many Linux distributions? Well, there are some excellent reasons. And if I say that this is the beauty of Linux, that we have so many distributions in Linux, it would not be wrong. As Linux is open source, it allows many developers to develop a particular distribution based on their needs and requirement. Some wanted to have Linux distributions for networking and some wanted for ethical hacking. The gaming community also jumped in and started developing Linux distributions with support for graphic cards and other necessary gaming related things. So this factor of open source nature forced the people or developers to make Linux distributions with the customized need of the users. Today, there are almost thousands of Linux distributions out there. Some of the prominent of them are Ubuntu, Kubuntu, Fedora, Manjaro, OpenSUSE, Kali Linux, Art Linux, etc. And these are only some of the few out there. Today, we also have some independent Linux distributions. For example, Fire Operating System for Amazon devices, Alpine for very light devices, and most prominent and the most used is Android that is being used by billions of people every day. So that was all about the Linux distributions, their history and some features. Let's talk about the installation of Linux on Windows operating system. Well, for that purpose, I'm going to use VMware Workstation. Here it is, I'll just open that one. And in terms of Linux operating system, I'm going to use Ubuntu 22.04 version. So this is my VM workstation. First of all, click on create a new virtual machine. I will install the operating system later. Next, from here, select Linux and here select for Ubuntu 64-bit because I'm going to install 64-bit version. Click on next, again, click on next. 
Here you can assign any amount of memory. I'll go with 40. Click on next. Customize your hardware. In terms of memory, I'll go slightly over four. Then in terms of processors, I'm okay with that. Now in terms of new CD, DVD, here I'll click on use ISO image file. I'll browse for my ISO file. Here is my Ubuntu 22.04 ISO file. I'll just double click on it. And after that, I'll click on close and I'll click on finish. Now it's time to start our virtual machine that we have created. So just click on this play button or power on button. It will start the installation process. From here, go with the first option. Hit enter. Here it has loaded our Ubuntu and now the installation process will begin. Now from this window, I'll click on install Ubuntu. Here we have to select the keyboard layout. I'll go with the default one, which is English US. I'll click on continue. Again, click on continue and leave everything as it is. And now click on install now button. Here, click on continue. From here, select your location and click on continue. Now it will ask you about your name and it will ask you to set a password. I'll have my username, then I'll choose a password. After that, click on continue. We are done with everything. Now the installation process has just begun. We'll wait for this process to get complete and then we'll move ahead. We are done here with the installation and now we just need to click on restart now. It will reboot our system and then we are good to go. So we are back here and now I'll click on my username and I will enter my password, hit enter. I'll maximize this and from here I'll just skip this, click on next, again next and click on done. For the moment, I'll change the resolution of my desktop so that I can have this view on whole of my screen. So I'll go to my display settings and from here I'll change the resolution to 1920 by 1080. Click on apply and we are good to go. Now after you are done with the installation of your Linux distribution, first thing that you should do is to update your system. So for that purpose, I'll open my terminal. I'll look for it. I'll open that one and in here I'll update it. Command for that is sudo apt update hit enter give it your password hit enter once again it will look for all the updates that are there into your system after that we'll upgrade our system so that all the updates gets installed into our ubuntu and then we'll have everything that we need in order to get the best out of our ubuntu after we are done with the update and upgrade i'll show you that there is one utility that we should install in order to get the best out of our ubuntu and to copy paste different things from our windows to ubuntu so we are done here with the update and now i'll write here sudo apt upgrade hit enter it will take a little bit of time as it says it will take around 1450 kilobytes of data i'll press y hit enter now it's time to install a utility and the command for that is sudo apt install open dash vm dash tool hit enter this is a utility and this utility will make sure that you have better experience with using your system and you can copy paste different things from your windows operating system to your ubuntu use the same command now and at the end of it right here dash desktop and after that hit enter we are done with everything in here and now make sure to reboot your system so that every change can take place permanently in your Ubuntu. And that's it for this video. Let's talk about a Linux boot process. In Linux, it comprises six steps or stages in a typical boot process. It starts with BIOS. Well, BIOS means basic input output system. It is responsible for loading and executing the MBR or master boot record boot loader. On turning on the computer, BIOS performs the integrity check on our hard drive that can be HDD or SSD. Then BIOS looks for the boot loader program which can be on a USB disk or on a CD-ROM. On detection of boot program, it loads it into the memory and BIOS gives the control of the system. On the second step, we have MBR. MBR or master boot record is responsible for the load and execution of the grub boot loader. MBR is present in the first sector of the bootable disk and contains the information about the grub or Lilo. 
if we talk about the old system lilo stands for last in last out on number 3 we have grub grub that is also called as gnu grub or gnu grub and it stands for grand unified bootloader the grub screen is the first screen that we see on the system boot up on our screen and you might have noticed that you can select different options from that screen and in case if you have multiple kernel images installed you can select the particular one from the list and bootloader or if i say the grub screen is present in every operating system no matter if it's windows ios or linux operating system on number 4 we get kernel it is also referred to as the core of any operating system as it has complete control over all the things in your system at this stage the kernel that was selected in the previous stage or got selected by default mounts the root file system that is available in the grub.con file and then executes the sbin/init program after that the kernel establishes the temporary root file system until and unless the read file system gets mounted on number 5 we have init or initialize at this point the system runs and executes the run level programs it looks for the init file and then decides the linux run level while well, there are six different run level available in terms of the linux operating systems i'll not go into the details of the run level because we are not concerned with them at this point number 6 run level programs Well, depending on the Linux distributions you have installed in the previous steps, you might see different services getting started. For example, you might see starting send mail dot 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 OK. These type of services are known as run level program, and each one of them gets executed on the run level. And as I have mentioned earlier, that we have six different run level. So that was everything that you need to know about the Linux booting process and that's it for this video and for this section. In this section we'll talk about the Linux fundamentals and we'll start with shell. Well shell is the Unix term for an interactive user interface that has an operating system as well. Well it is a layer of programming that understands and executes your command that you will enter in a particular script. and in some of the system this is also called as command interpreter and a shell can be constructed with the kernel which is the operating system's innermost layer of core services and we have two major type of shells the bone shell and the c shell and further bone shell has sub categories and these are as bone shell corn shell bone again shell posix shell in terms of c type shells it has two sub categories c shell which is also known as csh and then we have 10x or tops c shell it is also known as tcsh well the original shell was developed in 1970 by stephen r bone in at and t bell labs bone shell was the first one to appear on the scene and it was named after its developer Bone shell usually gets installed in the slash bin slash ssh directory. Now I'll talk about and I'll show you some of the examples of shell script, and I'll also show you that how you can run them and how you can use different commands from your terminal to run your shell scripts. So this is my Ubuntu and this is my terminal. First of all, what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a new file onto my desktop. So for that purpose I'll go to my desktop first I'll write here cd desktop and here I'll create a new file as script.sh This is my file here you can see if I open this file I can write any script into this file So first of all what I'm going to do here I'm going to write here echo space I'll write my name in here Basically whenever I'll run this script or I will execute this script I'll get this output onto my terminal let's do that and let's see so to run my shell script 
I have to use bash space name of the file which is script.sh hit enter here you can see I have my name as output you can write any code in here you can use if statement case statements your loops anything else you want and not only that you can also write and execute your terminal commands into your shell scripts as well for example if I write here date into my terminal this command will show me the current date this is the current date and now if I write here date into my shell script what it's gonna do it's going to show me the current date and if I write here ls this command will list out all the things that are there onto my desktop directory as well now let's save this and let's execute this script again I'll write here bash script.sh if I hit enter now so here you can see this is my echo statement this is my date command and this is my ls command so at the moment onto my desktop I only have one thing that is script.sh so this is how shell works and this is how you can write different codes into your shell and you can execute them so in this video we'll talk about some more linux command that a linux administrator must know so these are some of the commands that i'll be talking about and i'll show you each one of them by executing in the terminal so pwd you might know about this one well p stands for present w stands for working and d stands for directory basically it shows the current working directory then we have who am i it displays the current username then with history basically it will show you all the commands that you have entered or used into your terminal till now then with date command it will give you the current day date then we have man basically it gives a guide about a particular command let's say you do not know what pwd is you just need to write man space pwd and you will have a full guide related to pwd command then comes who it shows that who is the user who is logged in into the system w is the same command as who but with w it shows the processes as well then with clear command we can clear our terminal let's say we have used around 50 to 60 commands or even 5 to 10 commands and we want to clear our terminal with all of the outputs and all of the commands so for that purpose just write clear then with exit we get to exit from a particular process or current terminal let's say you are into your bash mode or you are into your super user mode and you want to get out of that so for that purpose you will have to enter exit and you will be out of your current mode now let's head to our terminal or our linux distribution and let's execute each one of them so this is my ubuntu and this is my terminal so first of all i'll write here pwd this is my current directory and I'm working in here. Now for the second command, I'm going to use who am I? It will show you the current user. So I'll write here who am I and make sure you do not enter any space, hit enter. So this is the user that is using the system currently. Then the third command is history. I will write here history, hit enter. It will show me all the commands that I have used till now. So this was the last one, then who am I, then pwd. So these were some of the commands until now, I have used around 240 commands into my terminal. Now for the fourth command, let's write here date and hit enter. So this is the current date and this is the time and this is the region of our date. Now for the fifth command, I'm going to write here man, hit enter. It is not going to show me anything and here it says what manual page do you want means it is asking that for which command you want to have the documentation so i'll write here pwd space cp cp stands for copy if you know hit enter so here we have all the documentation related to our cp command so this is how it works here is the description and here we have some other things now to get out of this, just press Q and we are out of it. For the sixth command, I'm going to write here who and hit enter. So this is the user that have been logged in and this is the time. So now I'm going to just write here W and hit enter. It is going to show me the same information, but with processes as well. Here you can see here we have the processes here as well. 
that have been run by this user for the eighth command i am going to write here clear and all of these things will get removed so i will just write here clear and here you can see we have a fresh new terminal in front of us now i'll show you that how we can use exit command first of all i'll write here bash hit enter and now we are into our bash mode now to get out of this i'll just write here exit and hit enter and now we are out of it or let's say i write here sudo su and we are into our super mode as you can see we are working as a root and we have access as a root to the whole system now to get out of this i'll just write here exit hit enter and now again we are back as a normal user so this is how you use exit command and these were some of the basic commands that a linux administrator should know so let's talk about how we can use different variables and how we can use different variables to take the input from the user so first of all let's write here variable i'll write here var equals and i will give it a value as this is variable now instead of writing this is variable in my echo command i'll just write here dollar sign var and if i hit enter or if i save this file before i run my script here make sure that you do not give any space before and after your variable and in case if you get the green color it means you are doing it right now let's try to run our script so i'll write here script.sh hit enter so here we have the result as this is variable it means we are successfully getting the result now let's write here x equals 10 y equals 15 and in my echo command i will print the result so i'll write here dollar sign and inside of my braces i have to call my variables so i'll write here x plus y now if you just use your single brackets let me show you save this file run the script again here it says command not found because you have to use double braces for your variables when you are doing your mathematical operation save this now let's try to run this and here we have the result as 25 so this is how we can use variables and this is how we can assign values to our variables now let's try to take the input from the users first of all i'll write here echo space and in that i'll write here enter first number basically i'm asking the user to enter the first number and to take the input we have a keyword as read so read will be used and after that i'll write here variable one now whatever the user is going to enter will get stored in variable one after that i'll write here echo and in that i'll write here enter second number and for that i'll write here read space variable 2 and now at the end i'll show the result so i'll write here echo dollar sign double brackets and inside i'll just add variable 1 with variable 2 now let's save this script head back to our terminal and let's try to run this and let's see what do we get so here it says enter first number i'll write here 10 and for the second i'll write here 200 hit enter so here we have the result as 210 so this is how you take the input from the user using the keyword as read now let's try something exciting with taking the input from the user first of all what i'm going to do i'll write here touch f1 f2 f3 f4 basically when i'll run my script I'm going to create four text files onto my desktop. After that, I will ask the user enter the name of the file that you want to delete. Let me correct the spellings. After that, I'll take the input in read keyword and I'll take the variable as variable one. Now, if you remember, to remove a particular file or to remove a directory we have a command as rm so i'll write here rm space hyphen i and as we are taking the input in variable one so i'll just write here dollar sign var one and if you remember when we used to delete a file or a directory we used to write here the file name or directory name but now i'm using the variable name 
after that i'll write here enter y to confirm or n to stop the process let's save this file let's head back to our terminal and as soon as i run my script you will see four files will be created right here and here are the files that we have just created now it is asking that which file do you want to delete let's delete f2 so i'll just write here f2 hit enter and here it says remove regular empty file i will just press y and hit enter so here we have successfully deleted that particular file basically we have made a small error in terms of writing our echo command so instead of writing it in here what i'm going to do i will just cut it and i will paste it above my remove command save it now let's rerun our script and here we have all the files and here it is asking that which file do you want to delete i want to go for f3 this time hit enter so here it says enter y to confirm or n to stop the process i'll write here y hit enter so here we have successfully deleted our file so how cool and how exciting it is that with the help of our shell scripting even we can run our different commands that we used to do into our terminal and not only single command we can do multiple commands and as much commands as per our liking and as per our need so this is the power of shell scripting so first of all to start your shell scripting you have to create a shell file or a script file so for that purpose i'll head to my desktop and here i'll create a file to create your bash file you just need to use your text editor there are many for example we have nano we have vim or vi and we have gedit so it's all up to you that with which one you want to go i'll show you an other smarter way that is more easier to use and that is if i write here vi space script.sh this will create a file onto my desktop and it will open this one into my vi text editor and here if you see we have successfully created our shell file or script file now in order to start typing into vi shell or vi text editor you have to press i and we are into an insert mode if you remember from the previous video so first of all we'll write here hash exclamation mark after that slash bin slash bash well we are telling that we are going to use this bash for the execution of our shell scripts hit enter and you can now start writing your scripts this is a very good practice to do in case if you do not write this line it is no worry because your linux distribution will take the default shell to run your scripts now what is this well this is the path and this path which is hash and exclamation mark it is called shebang hash called she and this is called bang so this is how the name has been invented for this particular shebang now let's start with our script first of all i'll just write here echo and in that i'll have my string i can write anything i'll write here this is my first script let's come to next file let's have another print statement and i'll write here this is linux administrator course we are good to go now let's get out of this and let's try to run this particular script to get out of this first of all press escape key and now write colon and write w and q w means write means whatever we have written in this file save it and then quit if i hit enter you will see a file will be created onto my desktop here is the file let me clear my terminal and now the question comes that how we can run this particular file well we have two ways first one is by writing bash space name of the file which is script.sh if i hit enter it will run this file here you can see we have the output as this is my first script this is linux administrator course let me clear my terminal and now let's talk about the second way and the second way is just right here dot slash name of the file which is script dot sh hit enter and here we have the same output that we had entered earlier if i ls here 
ls hyphen l here we have script.sh and here we have the execution permission available in your case it might not be available for you well to change the permission again use the same command which is chmod space 755 five five stands for execution or five stands for execution so i'm giving the execution permission to group and i'm giving the execution permission to other users as well give it a space write the name of the file and just hit enter and after that you are good to go now instead of going back with our vi command or vi text editor which is a bit difficult to use we have another way and that is let me clear my terminal and if you see here we have our script file just double click on it and it will open your script just like this one into your text editor and it is more easier to use as it will work just like notepad or notepad plus plus if you use window operating system so you can write anything you can copy anything from your keyboard you do not have to use your mouse anymore you do not have to use any shortcut like for example you have to press escape key then press colon then write wq to get out of this there is nothing like that we are good to go now let's do some interesting thing if you remember we use pwd to print out or to get the current working directory so if i write here pwd save my file head back to my terminal and use the same command to run my script which is script.sh so here if you see i haven't written pwd into my terminal but still i'm getting the result of my current working directory well this is the beauty of shell scripting that you can use your commands into your script to get the exact result now let's do something extra with this script i'll write here echo then I have my PWD after that let's have a date command and if you remember with date command we get the current date and let's print a message and in this message I'll write here this is the current date and after that let's save this file and let's get out of it and let's rerun our script and here we have current working directory and here we have our date so how cool it is. Now let's head back to our script file and let's list out the content that is available onto our desktop. Let me create one folder in here. I'll name it anything, hit enter. Let's create one more. I'll name it anything again and let's hit enter. So I have two folders and one file. Now I'll write here ls space hyphen l space slash home. Basically I'm giving the path to my desktop. So I'll write here Zubair, which is the user, then to the path to my desktop. So I will just do that. And after that, I'll save my file and let's head to our terminal, clear our terminal and let's run our script and let's see if we get the content of our desktop here or not. So here, if you see, we are getting the content of our desktop as well as we have these two folders. And this is the file, which is script.sh. So how cool is that, that from one single script, you can execute multiple commands very easily. So I'll clear my terminal and let's head back to our script and let's do something extra and something very exciting. I'll clear my first line as well, because if you remember, I told you that even if you do not write it, there is nothing to worry about. So I'll save my file. Now let's write here CD space slash downloads. Basically, I'm going into my downloads directory and what I want to do there, I want to create a directory and I want to name this directory as dir. After that, I'm done creating that directory. I want to go to into that directory. So I'll write here cd dir. I will hit enter. And after that, I want to create some of the files into that particular directory. So I'll write here touch. Now write the name of the files that you want to create. I'll write here F1 space F2 space F3 space F4 space F5. I'm going to create five files, but there is a small question for you. Will it go to the directory of downloads directly? I don't think so because at the moment we are into our desktop directory. So for that purpose, we have to give the complete path to our downloads directory. So I'll write here home and i will also write here the user which is zubair now let's save this file let's head back to our terminal 
and let's try to run this and let's see what do we get so here we have successfully executed our command and now let's head to our downloads directory and let's see if we have a directory with the name of dir and five files or not so here i have my download directory here i have dir folder and here we have all those five files that we created from our script so how cool and how powerful is shell scripting let's talk about getting help at the command line well there are several ways that we can get the help from our command line let's say you do not know anything about a particular command and you want to get the information about it let's say if i write here ls and i do not know what ls command is to get the information about ls command just write here ls space hyphen hyphen and write here help if you hit enter you will get all the information about this particular command what it is why this gets used and what are the different functions that we perform with it if you see here we have all the information in here well basically ls command gets used to list out the content of your current working directory if i write here ls these are different directories that are available onto my this particular working directory now let's say there are some unknown commands or there are some commands that you are not sure about if they exist into your system or if the packages exist into your system do not worry just simply write the command for example if i write here remote hit enter here the command line has given me the answer or you can say it has assisted me with this answer as it says command remote not found but can be installed with sudo snap install remote it means this package was not available into my system but i can install it now let's say i want to get the manual of a particular command for that purpose we have a command as man i write here man space and now you can write the command of which you want to get the manual i'll write here bash hit enter so this is the manual of bash here it says name bash this is the synopsis this is the copyright and this is the description and here we have every information about this bash or you can say this is the manual about it i will get out of this and now i'll show you one more thing let's say there is no manual available for a particular command but still you want to get the information about it so for that purpose we have a support from our terminal or command line in linux distributions and that is we have info command so just write here info give it a space and write the command i'm going to go with bash again although we do have manual available for bash but i just want to show you that how it works after that hit enter and this command will show you some of the information about your bash so here you can see we have all the info about our bash command so i'll just get out of this and that was all about getting help from the command line in this video we'll talk about linux file structure a linux file system can be termed as the collection of files or data on a disk drive or on the part of the disk called as a partition in a machine there can be more than one partition and every partition contains a file system there is a need to understand the structure of linux because it will help to understand the practical perspective of that and how it works in linux the file system possesses these sections first one is the root directory then comes some specific file data storage formats for example ext3 ext4 xfc xfs btrfs etc and every partition can have a particular or same file system now if we talk about what a linux file system is well it is a built in layer of any linux operating system that gets used to handling our storage data file management it helps in arrangement of files or data on disk storage for example managing file names sizes creation of data and other information now let's talk about the linux file system structure linux file system is a hierarchical structure and it contains a root directory at the top and its subdirectories we can access all the subdirectories and other directories directly from the root directory in general a partition or a disk 
has one file system but at the same time it can have more than one file system as well. In the Linux file system we have two part file system software architecture. If you see this image you will have a better understanding for example at the top we have kernel then we have virtual file system then we have ext3 basically the file and then at the end we have hardware. The file system of Linux needs an API to access the function calls to interact with the file system and its components like directories and files. API helps in tasks such as creating, deleting and copying files. The initial two parts of the given file system are called as a Linux virtual file system and it has a single set of commands for the developers and kernel to access the file system. Now I'll talk about the features of the Linux file system or structure. In Linux all the files are arranged in a tree like structure and all the files get arranged as a tree and its branches and as mentioned earlier the top directory is called as root and all the other directories can be accessed through it. Then we have some of the features like path specification which means in Linux it does not use the backslash for the separation of components and we use the forward slash as an alternative. If we talk about the directories or partition, well Linux does not use the drive letters for the organization of the drive as Windows does. For example, in Windows we name our directories as C, D, E, etc. In Linux, we cannot differentiate if we are targeting and addressing the network partitions or devices. And if we talk about the file extensions in Linux, our files may have .txt extension but it is not compulsion and necessary that a file have an extension. At the end I'll talk about hidden files. In Linux it distinguishes the standard files from the hidden files. Most of the time the configuration files will be hidden from the user and hidden files gets represented with dot before the name of the file. For example dot example. To access or open such files, we need to use some specific commands in the shell to change the view in the manager. I'm talking about the file manager here. And that was all about this video. And I hope now that now you have better understanding about it. In this video, we'll talk about working with directories. Well, we can create directories. We can delete them. We can create directories into a directory and we have different commands to delete different types of directories as well. So first of all, let's write here pwd and pwd will show you the current working directory. So I'm at home slash Zubair. If I ls here, ls will list out everything that is there into current working directory. So these are different things that are available at this point onto my current working directory. So what I want to do, I want to go to my desktop so I'll write here cd desktop and here I'll create a directory. To create a directory the command is mkdir give it a space and write the name that you want to give to your directory. I'll name it as folder1. Here if you see we have a new folder that has been created onto our desktop. So this is how you can create your directories. Well what if I want to create more than one directory for that purpose. Simply write the name of the directory, give it a space, write the name for the second directory, give it a space and write the name of your third directory. You can create any number of directories as per your liking with one simple command. So as I am going to create three directories, if I hit enter now you will see three new folders will be created onto my desktop. Here you can see we have four of them in total. Now let's go into one of these folders. To change your current working directory, we use cd command. So I'll write here cd and let's go into our folder 1. Hit enter and here we are into our folder 1. Now in folder 1, I'm going to create another directory. So I'll write here mkdir space and I'll name it as sub underscore dir. Hit enter. If I open my folder 1, here you will see that we have a folder with the name of sub underscore directory. I'll just close this one and now I'll go back one directory and for that purpose I'll write here cd space dot dot hit enter. Now we are onto our desktop. Now let's try to delete our directories with the help of our command. 
So for that purpose, the command is rmdir, which stands for remove directory. Give it a space, write the name of the directory that you want to delete. I'm going to delete my folder 2. Hit enter. Folder 2 have been deleted. Let's do the same for folder 3. Let's do the same for folder 4 and hit enter. Now, let's try to do the same for folder 1. But this command will not be able to delete this directory as this directory is not an empty one and we have a directory into this one as well. If I hit enter, here it says fail to remove folder 1 directory not empty. So for these kind of scenarios where we have a directory that is not empty, we have to use different command and the command is rm space hyphen r then give it a space and now write the name of the directory that you want to delete. Hyphen r stands for recursive. Now if I hit enter you will notice that folder 1 will be deleted and we have successfully deleted our folder 1. So this is how you can create your directories. This is how you can delete them and we have also seen that how we can delete such directories that are not empty. Now what if I want to create a directory into a particular directory without moving to that particular directory. First of all, let me write here cd. Let me clear my terminal. Now let's say I want to create a directory into my downloads. So for that purpose, simply write here mkdir, give it a space and here we'll give the path to my downloads directory. And the path is home slash username which is Zubair and after that write the directory name which is download in my case. After that, giving your slash, write the name that you want to give to your directory. I'm going to name it as folder123. If I hit enter, now let me open my files explorer and I'll show you that if it is there or not. Here is my downloads directory and here you can see we have our folder123 in here. And in case if you want to remove this directory, you can use the rmdir command in order to delete it. Here you can see we have successfully deleted this one as well. So that was all about how we can work with directories, how we can create them, how we can delete them and how we can access any directories from our current working directories. That's it for this video. Let's talk about finding files, listing files and editing files. First of all, let's start with finding files. Let me go to my desktop and here if I write find file hit enter here we do have a file with the name of file. Basically I have asked my terminal to find a file with the name of file. If I write here file 2.txt and hit enter it will give me that answer. Let's try something else in here. If I write here file 123 hit enter it says no such file or directory. Other than that we do have one more sophisticated way to find out our files. If I write here find space tilt sign slash desktop, it means all the directories owned to the desktop, then give it a space hyphen name and write the name of the file that you want to find out. If I write here file 2, hit enter, what it's gonna do? It's gonna exactly look for the file 2. And we do not have anything as an output because we do not have any file with the name of file2. We do have a file that says file2.txt. So for that purpose, you have to be exact what you are looking for. Now it has returned me with this answer. Well, what if you do not want it to be case sensitive? In that case, instead of using hyphen name, write here hyphen i name and at the end of it, I'll remove .txt and I'll remove 2 as well. Now if I hit enter, it will give me all the files that have file. Now if I write here file 1, hit enter, it has written me file 1 as well. But we do not have any file with file 1. We have file 1 with capital F. But as we have used hyphen i name, that is why it has ignored capital or small f and it has just written me the exact result that I was looking for. Well, what if I want those files that have been configured or edited or changed in last 30 days? For that purpose, we'll use the same command, but instead of I name or name, we'll write here hyphen M time space hyphen 30. 
if I hit enter, so these are all the files that have been created, edited, configured or changed in last 30 days. You can also look for those files that have a particular size. For example, I want to list out those files that have the size of less than 10 megabytes. So for that purpose, I'll write here hyphen size space hyphen 10 at the end of it right here capital M. If I hit enter now, it will show me all those files that have the size of less than 10 MB. Here you go. All these files are less than 10 MBs. Not only that, in case if you want to look for those files that have the size higher than 10 megabytes, instead of writing here minus 10, write here plus 10. And if I hit enter now, it will not show me anything because we do not have any file exceeding this size. So that was all about finding out the files. Now let's talk about listing out the files. Let me clear my terminal. Well, to list out the content of your current working directory, we use ls command ls command will list out everything. So in my home directory, I have desktop, documents, download, music, and all these folders or directories. Let's go to our desktop. And now if I ls here, we have file, file one, file two.txt, file.txt, and all of these are in here. So ls command will simply list out the content. We do have some of the flags that we can use along with our ls command, and that is ls hyphen l. It will list out everything with detail. So here, if you see, we have permission for honor group, other users. Then we have the group user. We have date of creation and then we have name of the file. Other than minus L or hyphen L, we do have hyphen LH. What it's going to do, it's going to show me the exact information, but this time it will also show us the size of our files. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write here hyphen A and hyphen A will show me all the hidden files as well. We do not have any hidden files onto our desktop. Now let's go back to our desktop. And if I write here LS space hyphen L and T, what it's going to do, it's going to show me the files on the base of their last modified date. So how cool is that? And now if I write here hyphen L along with S, it will sort the files on the base of their sizes as you can see so that was all about listing out the files and now i'll show you that how we can edit our file as you can see we have different files onto our desktop well to edit these files we have different ways either we can use our command prompt or you can say our terminal directly or we can use some text editor and in text editor we have two options either we can use those that are available inside the terminal or we can use the GUI application as well. For example, if I double click on file, it will open my file like this and you can edit it simply in here. But what if I do not want to open my GUI, I want to do it from my terminal. Well, for that purpose, first way is to write here cat space angle bracket, or you can say greater than sign, then write the name of the file, which is file in my case. Here, it will allow you to add anything that you want to do. I'll write here, this is Linux administrator course, hit enter and press control C. Now, if I open my file, here you can see here it says, this is Linux administrator course. And in case if you want to list out or if you want to see the content of your file, simply write here cat space file name. Do not write here greater than sign, hit enter. And here it says, this is Linux administrator course. So this is the first way. Second way is to use text editors. I'll use two of them. First one is nano space name of the file. In my case, it is file. Now here you can simply edit this file and you can write anything in here. I write here, my name is Zubair. This is Ubuntu. And to get out of this, just press control X and then press Y to save the changes. Hit enter. Now let's write here cat space file hit enter. So here you can see here we have all those things that we have added. Now along with nano we do have one more editor and that is vim. Right here in file name hit enter and now we are into our vim text editor. In order to go into insert mode press escape key and then press i. 
and down here it says insert it means now we are into our insert mode and we can write anything into this particular file as per our liking now to get out of insert mode again press escape key and press colon exclamation mark wq and we are out of our text editor so these are some of the ways that you can follow in order to edit your files and in order to add the content in your different files from your terminal or using your graphical user interface applications as well and that's it for this video let's talk about setting up files and directory permissions well we have a command as chmod chmod stands for change mode and we'll use this command to assign different permissions to our files and directories well first of all there is a need to understand different types of permission and different types of users well we have three types of users first one is the user or the owner of the file or directory then comes the group of the file or directory and then comes all other user other users are those users who are not the owner of a file or a directory and are not part of any group as well then in terms of permissions we have three types of permission read write and execute first of all let me go to my desktop so that we can understand it in a better way if i write here ls space hyphen l hit enter so here if you see here we have rw dash then rw dash and then we have r dash dash at the start of this line we also have dash and down here if you see in front of permissions we have t instead of dash well dash means this is the file and d mean this is the directory after that the permissions start read stands for r write gets represented by w and execute gets represented by x here if you see in front of permissions we do have x available okay first rw dash is for owner or user second rw dash or second group of permission here is for group and the last one which is r dash dash is for other users and here is the user which is where and here is the group of this particular file so basically the file has user as Zubair and group as Zubair as well. Now, in order to assign different permissions to our files and directories, we have two modes, absolute mode and symbolic mode. In absolute mode, we use different numbers to assign permission. And in symbolic mode, we use symbols like this one. As you can see, we have RW, RW, R and we have x for execution as well here we have absolute mode number zero means no permission and in symbolic mode it will be dash 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 if you go with one it means execute and in symbolic mode it will be like dash dash x and same goes for other things in case if you go with seven it means read write and execute and in symbolic mode it will be rwx and it means you are assigning all the permissions to the users now i'll show you an example i'll write here ch mod space 777 space file and i will just hit enter now if i ls hyphen l here here you can see in front of our file we have read write execute for our user read write execute for our group read write execute for other users and here is the user and here is the group now if I write here chmod 700, what it's going to do, it will assign all the permission to the user and it will assign no permission to group and other user. If I write here ls hyphen l, here you can see we have rwx and then we have no permission for group and no permission for other users. So this is how you can use your absolute mode. Now I'll show you how we can use symbolic mode. Well, for symbolic mode, we have three operations that we can perform. Either we can add the permission, we can remove the permission, or we can override the permission. I'll write here chmod space u. u stands for users, and in case if you want to change the permission for group, you will use g. For other user, you will use o. And for all the users, you will use a. So I'll write here u. And now as I'm going to assign the permissions, I will write here plus sign. 
In case if I want to remove a particular permission, I'll write here minus sign. And in case if I want to override some permissions, I'll write here equal. Now, as we know that file have read write permission for the user. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove execution permission from file for my user. So I'll write here minus x space name of the file hit enter. Okay, here we have to write ch mod without e. Now if I hit enter, if I ls hyphen l here, here you can see that execution permission is no longer here. Now I'll use the same command and instead of minus, I'll write here plus and it will add execution permission. And here you can see now we have execution permission here as well. Now let's do the same for all the user. And if you remember, for all user, it gets represented by A. I'll write here equal and I'll write here read, write, execute. It means I'm going to assign all the permission to all the users. Hit enter, ls here and all the users have read, write, execute permission no matter if it is user, group or other users. Same goes for our directories as well. I'll show you that how we can do that. I'll write here chmod space 700 space permissions. If I hit enter ls hyphen l here, here you can see in front of our permissions, we only have read write execute permission for the user. We do not have any permission for group and same goes for other users. So this is how you assign different permission. Now here, in case if you want to change the user of this particular file, you can do so. For that purpose, we'll write here sudo chon space name of the user that you want to assign. I'll write here root space name of the file, which is file in my case. Give it your password, hit enter. And now if I ls hyphen l here, so here you can see now the owner of this file is root and the group is bad. You can also change the group as well. And that brings us to the end of this video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we'll talk about deleting, renaming, copying and mounting files. First of all, let's start with deleting files. As you can see, we have four files onto our desktop and in order to delete them, we have two ways. Either we can use rm command or we can use unlink command. I'll show you both of them. First of all, I'll write here rm space name of the file. I'm going to delete file one. And if I hit enter now, we do not have file one anymore onto our desktop. Let's do the same with our unlink command. So I'll write here unlink space file two dot txt hit enter. And file two is no more onto our desktop. Now I'll show you that how you can delete a particular file from your current directory. As I'm onto my home directory, I'll delete this file. For that, either you can use rm or unlink as well. I'll write here rm space slash home slash username, which is Zubair slash desktop, and then name of the file, which is file.txt. If I hit enter, you will see this file will get deleted. Now I'll do the same for my script.sh. I'll use the same command and instead of writing here file.txt, I'll write here script.sh, hit enter and we have successfully deleted this file. So that was all about deleting the files. Now let's talk about how we can rename our files. Well, we have several ways. I'll show you two of them. First one is by using move command or mv command. As I'm onto my desktop and I have a file with the name of file only, so I'll write here mv space file space and here I'll write the name that I want to give to this particular file. I'll write here Linux, hit enter. And here you can see we have a file now with the name of Linux and file with the name of file is no more here. So this is the first way that you can follow and the second way is you can use the rename command. But for that, you have to install it. So I'll write here sudo apt install rename hit enter. Now I'll use this command that says rename hyphen v. It will show me the output as well. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to find out every file that has extension as .txt and it will change that extension into .edf. So here, if you see here, we have three files. 
with the name of file1.txt, file2.txt, file3.txt. As soon as I hit enter, I'll have different file extension. Here you can see all of these files have been changed and now we have file1.pdf and same goes for other two files. So this is how you can change the name of your files and now let's move on to copying our files from one directory to another. First of all, let's open our Linux file and in that file, let's enter some random data. And after that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just save this file, close this. And now if I write here, cp linux space zubair underscore linux. And if I hit enter now, what it's going to do, it will copy everything that is there in this particular file. And it will copy it into the new file with the name of zubair underscore linux. And here we have new file with zubair underscore linux name. If I just double click on this one, here you can see we have the same data that we entered into our Linux file. So copy command creates a copy of your file and creates a new file with the new name. Now, in case if you want to copy this particular file or any file into any directory, you can do so. For that purpose right here, cp linux space name of the directory. In my case, I'm going to copy this file into my permissions folder. If I hit enter now, let's open our permissions folder and here we have a file with the name of Linux. Now, let's say I want to copy this file into a directory that is not the present one and it is something other. So for that purpose, I'll simply write here cp file1.pdf. After that, I'll give the path where I want to copy this file. I'll copy this file into my downloads directory hit enter let's open our files and let's go to our downloads directory and let's see if we have file one or not so here we do have file one dot pdf we can do the same for more than one files so instead of writing here file one dot pdf i'll write here file two dot pdf space file three dot pdf hit enter here you can see we have file two dot pdf and file three dot pdf here as well so this is how you can copy your files from one directory to another and copy just work like copy paste that you do in your windows operating system. Now let's talk about mounting the files. Well, it allows us to have logical access to the data and it is similar to assigning drive letters to partition in windows operating system. Without mounting the file system, we cannot access the logical files from block devices. First of all, I'll check what are the partitions available into my system so i'll write here sudo f disk space hyphen l if i hit enter so these are the different partitions that are available into my system and these are sda1 sda2 and sda3 after that we have to check which one of them are active and which one of them are not so for that i'll write here df hyphen h hit enter so here if you see we have three devices and all of them are working and all of them are mounted. SDA3 is also mounted. SDA2 is also mounted. And SDA1 is for BIOS boot. Well, in your case, you will have one of the partitions that will not be mounted. I'll show you that how you can mount it. First of all, we'll have to create a directory. So I'll write here sudo mkdir. And here you can name your directory anything. I'll name it as xyz. Hit enter. We have successfully created our directory. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to mount my SDA2 partition into this particular directory. You can do the same for your directory or your partition that is not mounted. The command for that is sudo space mount space slash dev slash SDA2 space slash name of the directory, which is XYZ in my case, hit enter. Now, if you see here, my SDA2 partition have been mounted onto my XYZ directory. So this is how you can mount your partitions that are not mounted. And this is how you can access the files and data in those partitions. Now, in case if you want to unmount this partition, we have a command that we can follow. We have two ways. Either you can write here sudo umount space, write the name of the directory directly. So if I write here XYZ, it will unmount my directory and whatever there is into that particular directory. 
So as we have this partition, so this partition will get unmounted automatically or we can also follow the file system which is dev space sda2 space slash and after that we write here the name of the directory but I'll follow the first way so I'll just write here xyz hit enter now if I write here df space hyphen h so here you can see sda2 is back onto boot slash efi so this is how you can mount and unmount your partitions using your file system or this is how you can make your partitions available and access their data by mounting them and that also brings us to the end of this video in this video we'll talk about comparing files searching files using pipes first of all i'll start with comparing files well to compare our files into our linux distributions we have a command as diff so here i have two files let me open both of them and I'll show you the content of both files. So in my file, I have five lines and in my file one, I have seven. I have alternative and nice that is not there into my file. So this is the difference between both of them. Now let's use the command as diff space name of the files that I want to compare. If I hit enter now and whenever you will see these kind of labels like A and again we have A here or you might see d and you will also see c a means add c mean change and d mean delete well what does it mean here it says 2a3 it means after the line number 2 add line number 3 from file 2 first number indicates file 1 and second number indicates file 2 and the label indicates the type of operation here it says after the line number 2 in file 1 add what it should add line number three which is in file one so if i see what is there in file one on line number three it is alternative and down here we also have alternative as an output so this is the first difference that we have between both of these files after that it says after line number four add what it should add line number six on to our file one so if I open this file one, which is my basically file two, here we have nice and nice is the difference between both of them as well as you can see. In case if this is a bit of difficult to understand or you can say it is a bit of challenging to understand, we have another way that we can use this command and that is diff space hyphen y space hyphen w. After that, I'll write here 60 and after that, write the name of the files that you want to compare, hit enter. So here you can see we have line by line comparison of both files. Here it says alternative and nice in file one. And here in file, we do not have alternative and file. So this is another way that you can follow in order to check the output of your both files. There is another way that you can follow to use your diff command in order to check only if there is a difference or not and that is diff space hyphen q hyphen q is a flag that will only let you know if there is a difference or not so i'll write here file and file one hit enter here it says files file and file one differ means they are not similar there is some particular thing that is not common in both of these files let me make both of these common so i'll just delete alternative from here and i'll delete nice from here as well let's save this file let's close this one and let's use the same command and here we do not have any output it means both of these files are same so this is how you can compare your file into your linux distributions and now let's move on to the searching our files along with using pipes if we talk about the pipe pipe is a form of redirection that transfer the standard output to some other destination and it gets used in Linux and other Unix operating system to send the output of one command to another command. We can use our pipes with our find commands, with our ls commands, with our cat commands, and with anything. To use a pipe, we have to use a special character that is like this. And then you can use your pipes. Now I'll show you two of the examples that how you can use your pipes to find out your files into your Linux distributions. First of all, I'll show it to you that how you can use it with your ls command because we know to list out or to find out some files 
into our system we use ls command now if i ls here into my system here you can see i have file 1.txt and file.txt let's create some of the other files onto our desktop as well so i'll write here touch f1 space f2 space r4 space t7 space t5 space file 3 space file 5 and now if i hit enter basically i have created all these random files now i'll use my pipe in order to find particular files so for that purpose if i write here ls space now i'll use the pipe in here so i'll write here grep what grep will do it will find out a file with a particular name so i will write here file i want to find out all the files that have name file in them so if i hit enter now so these are the four files that have files in their name so this is how you can use your pipes in order to search for a particular file now i'll show you that how you can use your pipes along with your find command if i write here find space hyphen name space and now i'll use the pipe and here i'll write here xarg basically i will print out the output and if i write here cat what i'm going to do in here i'm going to print out all the output of the files that i'm going to search onto my terminal and what are the files that i want to search and i want to print out well i'll use inverted commas static dot txt i want to look for all those files that have extension as dot txt so if you see here these two files have the extension as dot txt and now if i hit enter and here i have the output from these two files so this is how you can use your pipes in order to search for your particular files for your particular data and not only that you can also perform different operations with the help of that and that's it for this video i'll see you in the next one in this video we'll talk about input output redirection well in linux it refers to the ability of our linux operating system that allows us to change the standard output and standard input when we execute a command in our terminal by default the standard input is keyboard and standard output is our terminal or our screen now i'll show you some of the examples so that we can understand this phenomena in a better way if i write here ls space hyphen l here you can see here i have some of the files well let's go back and now if i write here ls space hyphen l here you can see I have total 36 and these are different files and different directories. Now what I want to do, I want to change the standard output and to change the standard output we use greater than sign or this arrow. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to create a file or we already have a file that says file.txt. If I write here cat space file.txt hit enter. We do not have anything into this one. I'll write here cat space arrow sign file dot txt hit enter. I'll write here my name is Zubair. I'll get out of this. And here if I write cat space file dot txt hit enter, here it says my name is Zubair. It means we have some output in this particular file. Now what I'm going to do here, I'm going to write here ls space hyphen l and I'm going to shift all of this output into my file.txt file. So how I'm going to do this? Well, for that purpose, I'll write here ls space hyphen al. A stands for hidden files. After that, I'll use my greater than sign or this arrow sign. After that, I'll write the name of the file in which I want to shift this output. Hit enter. And now if I write here cat space file.txt hit enter. So here you can see I have all the output from my ls command into my file.txt file. So how cool is that and how easy it is to redirect our output into some particular file. Now I'll show you that how we can redirect our input into a particular file or a particular way. Well, the method is really simple. And here if I write wc space hyphen l space file.txt hit enter what basically i have done here i have asked my wc command to find out the number of lines into my file.txt 
if i open this one here you can see we do not have anything into this one let me add some of the random data in this particular file and let's save this file let me close this one and now if i use the same command here we have eight lines now how we can use or how we can redirect the input what i'm going to do here i'll write here wc space hyphen l space less than sign or this arrow and after that i'll write the name of the file of which i want to know about the number of lines now if i hit enter you will see the same output here it says eight lines and earlier it was also showing us the file name but this file name is now the input for this particular command and this is how we can redirect our input as well now i'll do the same for my file one.txt and let's see what do we get as a result we get five let's see how many lines are there in our file one so we do have five number of lines in here it means we have successfully redirected our input as well so this is how we can redirect our input and output what if i want to redirect my errors as well for example if i write here program space a b c and here it says program command not found what if i write here program space two arrow sign and now if i write here a b c hit enter now we do not have any error or any message basically what it has done two arrow is a command that has shifted this arrow into this particular file here you can see now we have a file with the name of abc and if you just open this one you will see command not found message as an input into this particular file so this is how you can redirect your errors as well and i'm sure when you will working with your servers this command will help you a lot now what i'm going to do here i'm going to add something into this particular file for example if i write here cat space arrow sign and now if i write the name of the file which is abc and now if i enter what it will do it will replace this file and it will replace the content of this file with the new content that i will write here but i do not want to do that i want to append some of the input so for that purpose we'll use double arrow sign if i hit enter now and now i'll write here hi how are you hit enter get out of this and now if i write here cat space abc here you can see now we have successfully appended our input into our files so this is how you can redirect your errors and how you can append your inputs in this video we'll talk about shell aliases well shell aliases are shortcut names that we set for our different commands and it consists of one word or even one letter basically we use it to replace our commands with those words that are pretty easy to use or pretty easy to remember for example let's say you use some particular command daily on a huge number of messages for example if i write here ls space hyphen l or a hit enter let's say you use this command hundred of time daily or on each session what if there is a way that i can replace this long command with something that is really small in size and i can remember it easily well for that purpose alias comes ahead and we can use that for example if i write here echo space zubair hit enter here i have an output but if i write here alias space e equal and inside i'll write my command for which i want to have a shortcut word now if i hit enter and now if i write here e zubair hit enter here you can see now e is also working just like echo and i have my output let me clear my terminal if i write here ls space hyphen l or a and l or a stands for reverse order list all hit enter now i want something for this command so that i can remember and use it easily for that purpose i'll write here alias space you can name it anything you can keep any word you can keep any character for that i'll go with lr or even you can go with za xyz or you can go with any particular character or word i'll write here lr equals 
inverted commas and inside I'll write here ls space hyphen l r a now I will hit enter and now if I write here l r instead of ls space hyphen l r and hit enter it will show me the same output how cool and how easy it is now that I can use the same command using l r words and nothing else well let me open new terminal let me close the previous one Basically what I have done, I have started a new session for my terminal. If I write here LR, it says LR not found. Why is that so? Because we have just set this command for our LS space hyphen LR. Well, basically it is because all these type of command are stored into a file that is called as bash RC. So I'll write here nano space dot bash RC, hit enter. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to write this command into this particular file so that it can stay there forever and whenever I call LR it can run ls space hyphen LR so for that purpose I'll write here alias space LR equals and in here I'll write ls space hyphen LRA now I will just get out of this and now if I write here LR hit enter here you can see now it is working so this is how you can have your commands and you can create different shortcuts and different words for your long commands or commands that are not easy to remember and they are long in nature. Now in case if you want to unalize some particular command you can do so. For that purpose we have a command as unalias space write the name of the command and in my case it was lr hit enter and now if I write here lr here it says lr command not found because we have just unalyzed it. So this is how shell aliases work. And that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we'll talk about environment variables. Well, in Linux or Unix based operating system environments, the environment variables are the dynamic named values that are stored within the system and gets used by applications in shell or subshells. In simple words, if I say, an environment variable is a variable that has a name and has some associated value. We have two types of variables. First one is global and second one is local. Global means you will get that variable in whole of your system and by local it will have some limited scope. Now let's see some of the environment variables and their values and how they looks like. First of all for example if I write here echo space dollar sign path there is one compulsion with our environment variables and that is their name is in capital if you write any character in small letters you will see an error so write here and make sure that you have your environment variable in capital words now if i hit enter it will show me the value of this environment variable now i'll use the same command and i'll use here user variable what it will do it will show me the user of this particular system which is Zubair at this time. Now I'll write here print environment or env space home. What I'm going to do basically I want to print out the environment variables that has the name as home. Hit enter it will show me the current working directory which is home underscore Zubair. But if I run print env or env only without any argument it will show me the list of all the environment variables. So let's write here print env and hit enter. So these are all the environment variables that are there into my system. If you see here, every variable has capital words. If you see here, name of every environment variable is in capital words. Now let me clear my screen. And now let's say I want to create a new variable. So for that purpose, what I have to do here, I will write here new variable and again make sure to have everything in capital and then give it some value i'll give it a value as zubair underscore aslam hit enter now let's print this variable so for that i'll write here echo space dollar sign and then i'll write here new variable hit enter here it says zubair aslam let's try to remove our dollar sign from here and let's see what do we get as a result well it will simply print out new variable as it will take it as an argument so make sure to use dollar sign whenever you want to use your environment variables
Now, what if I want to unset a particular variable or the variable that I have created? Well, most of the time you will use your unset variable command in order to unset those variable that you have created. So for that purpose, I'll write here unset space name of the variable. In my case, it was new variable, hit enter. And now if I write here echo space dollar sign new variable, it will not show me anything because we have just unset the value of our new variable and it does not possess anything and it does not exist into our memory. Well, as I have mentioned earlier that we have two types of variable, like we have global and local environment variables. Now I'll show you that how you can create or how you can have a global level environment variable. So for that purpose, we write here export space here, write the name that you want to give to your variable. I'll name it as var equals here. I'll assign it value. So I'll write here Linux hit enter. Now, in order to get the output of this particular variable, again, we have to use echo command. So I'll write here echo space dollar sign. And after that, we have to write the name of the variable. And in my case, it was war. So here we have Linux as an output. You might be wondering that what if I want to have an environment variable for the local level? Well, do not worry. I have just shown you the example where we had our environment variable as new variable and it had the value as Zubair Aslam. So whenever you want to have an environment variable with global scope, we'll use export along with it. And that brings us to the end of this video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we'll talk about shell history. Well, the simplest way of finding out the history of our shell is use arrow key. If you just press upper arrow key, it will show you the last command that you have used till now. Keep pressing this upper key and it will keep on showing you the one earlier command than the last one. If you press your down arrow key, it will show you the one after command. This is one of the simplest way. Other than that, we also have some of the variables for our history in our Linux shell as well. And the command for that is echo space dollar sign hist file size. And as it is an environment variable, so make sure you have everything in capital hit enter. So here it says we have the capacity to store 2000 command into our shell history. Now we have another command that we can use. I'll write here echo space dollar sign. And if I write here hist size and hit enter here it says thousand command this thousand command is per session this is overall and this is per session it means per session it can store these number of commands other than that let me clear my terminal if i write here history hit enter it will show me the history of all the commands that i have used till now and other than that we also have the number along with our command on 367 number, I have used clear command. On 368, I have used history command. And same goes for earlier commands. Now, if I write here, history space 10, hit enter. It will show me all the last 10 commands that I have used till now. Let's write here five. And now it will show me only five of the last commands that have been used. Now, if I write here, history, and this time I'll use a pipe along with it. I'll write here more, hit enter. What it's going to do, it will show me one full screen of command. As you can see, I'm only able to see those command that can fit into this screen size. Just press your space key and it will keep on showing you next set of commands just like this one. Now to get out of this, just press control C and you are good to go. Now, what if I want to look for substring into my commands. Let's say I have used find command into my Linux shell and I know I have used it several number of times, but I do not know where it is and what was the exact command. For that purpose, I can use substring phenomena and to use substring phenomena, just press control R and write here command or substring that you want to find out. I'll write here find. And now you can see here, it has shown me the command that have find in it. Now keep on pressing control R and it will keep on showing you all those command in which find was there. 
So how cool is that and how easy it is that now we can see all those command with the help of our substring. Now to get out of this again press Ctrl R or press escape key and we are good to go. We have another pipe that we can use along with our history command and that is history space hit a pipe here and then right here tail space hyphen 10 hit enter it will show you the last 10 commands that you have used till now but I don't see any difference between using a pipe and using history space 10 because it will also show me the last 10 commands that I have used till now. Now here is one interesting thing and that is what if I want to use this particular command that is on number 365 and I don't want to use the command as it is I want to use some other way. Well good news is we do have another way and that is just right here exclamation mark and write the number of the command that you have used or you want to execute. I want to execute command number 365. If I hit enter here you can see it has executed this particular command and here we have an output. Now let's say I want to print out or I want to execute a command from the bottom 1 2 3 4 5 and this is the fifth number of command from the bottom. So what I'll do here I'll write here exclamation mark hyphen 5 hit enter and here you can see it has printed or executed the command that is after the number fifth. Here is history 5 and here we have all the last five commands that we have executed till now. So this is how you can use your history in your shell in your Linux distribution and that's it for this video. In this video we'll talk about processes and job control and scheduling jobs. Well scheduling of processes is one of the most important aspect or you can say the role of any operating system no matter if it is Windows, Linux, iOS or any other. A process scheduler deals with the processes and their scheduling in Linux and it uses scheduling algorithm that helps in deciding the process to be executed next or which process should have the higher priority. Now process scheduling is one of the most important aspect or role of any operating system. In similar to other Unix based operating system in Linux a process scheduler deals with the process scheduling and it also chooses a process to be executed and also decides that for how long the chosen process will get executed in the system. Now there are some types of scheduling in our Linux. First one is real time process. In real time processes we have those processes that cannot be delayed in any situation and that is why they are called as real time processes and they are referred to as urgent processes. And we have two types of real time processes. First one is schedule underscore FIFO and the second one is schedule underscore RR. Second type of processes are normal processes. Normal processes are completely opposite of the real time processes and normal processes will execute or stop as per the time assigned by the process scheduler. That is why they are called as normal processes. So that was a brief introduction about process scheduling in Linux. Now I'll talk about the job scheduling into the Linux and how we can schedule a job with the help of some commands from our terminal. So the first command that I'm going to use is cron tab. If I write here cron tab hyphen L what it will do it will check if there is any cron tab or any cron job for Zubair or not. Zubair is the name of the user basically in here. So as we do not have any of them in here so what I'm going to do I'm going to create one. So the command for that is sudo space cron tab space hyphen E. Hyphen E stands for edit hit enter and it will open the file in your nano editor or vim editor. It has opened the file for me in nano editor. So what I'm going to do I'm going to schedule a job in here. There is a syntax to schedule a job and I'll talk to you about it in detail. This is the syntax. Basically we have five static and then comes the command. First static means minutes then comes hours then comes date then comes month and then comes the current day or the day of the month on which you want to schedule this particular job. After that comes our command. So what I'm going to do here I'm going to delete it and here I'll schedule a job. So here if you see the time is 
11 15 so first of all i'll write here minute i'll write here 17 then we'll have our hours i'll write here 11 then we have to write here date i'll write here 20 after our date we have to write or we can ignore month and day in order to ignore it i'll just write here static space static and after that here i'll have my command or job i'll write here touch space home slash username which is where and here i want to create a file with the name of file xyz dot txt now press ctrl x press y hit enter and here you can see it says installing new cron tab let's wait and get to 1117 and let's see if we get a new file with the help of this cron tab or job scheduling or not and now if i ls hyphen l here here you can see we have a file with the name of file xyz.txt and it has been created on 1117 as well so that shows that the job that we wanted to schedule is working pretty fine and this is how you can schedule your jobs from your terminal and that was all about process scheduling and job scheduling in linux and that's it for this video in this video we'll talk about the partitioning and mainly we'll discuss the partition table and partition type well the partition table is a data structure of 64 bytes that offers the basic information for the computer's operating system regarding the division of the hdd into primary partitions you might have seen that we have one hdd or ssd connected in the system but in terms of partition we can have more than one partition so to organize the data in those partitions the data structure is important each partition is a logically independent section of the hdd and the first four partitions on the disk are the primary partitions the mbr contains the partition table and all of its information and on the boot up of the operating system mbr contains the information the bios needs about the hdd access because the operating system is located on that if we talk about the working phenomena of the hdd we have tracks or centric circles on the magnetic media on our disk with a magnetic head the head remains stationary and the disk gets to spin we have a magnetic platter that is coated with highly sensitive magnetic material and gets used by the hdd to store the data the mbr goes through the partition table to find out which partition is the active one and the partition table starts with the hexadecimal position in the boot section with base 16 and the partition table contains six type of data in it the active flag and it is with the 0x00 for off and 0x80 for on and it contains one byte the starting head cylinder and sector and it is composed of three bytes then the file system descriptor of one byte then the ending head cylinder and sector again it contains or it composed of three bytes then comes the starting sector that is relative to the disk beginning and it is composed of four bytes and then comes the number of sectors in the partition and it is also composed of four bytes so that was all about the partition table and now let's talk about the partition types well generally we have two types of partition in linux data partition and swap partition the data partition it contains the system data normal linux and the root partition that contains the complete data that is needed to start and run the system on the other hand the swap partition is the extension of the system or the computer's physical memory most of the linux system contains a root partition one or more swap partition and one or more data partition system can have partition for other system data as well for example those partitions with fat or vfat file system other than these two types of file system linux also supports other file system types such as gfs nfs fat xx razor file system and many others the root partition that gets indicated with a single forward slash is about 100 to 500 megabyte in size and it contains the system configuration files and most basic commands and server program and the home directory of the administrative users along with some other things 
and the swap space is accessible only to the file system itself and remains hidden during normal operations. Swap makes sure that your system keeps on working and virtually you might have never seen messages like out of memory etc. Because of the swap memory, this problem gets handled on the back end. So that was all about the partition table and partition type and that was all about this video. In this video, we'll talk about purpose of file system. Well, Linux file system is a layer of an operating system built in. It gets used to handling the data management and along with that helps in arranging the files on disk storage. The file system is also responsible for managing the file size, names, data creation and many other tasks. There are many file systems for Linux and not every file system is for you. Well, on the installation of the operating system, Linux will offer you several file system like ext, ext2, ext3, ext4, btrfs, etc. And each file system has its working phenomena. In case you want to look or you want to find out about the file system your system currently has, we have a command that we can use. Open your terminal and write here df. DF stands for disk free. It will give you the information about your disk. But here we want to know about the file system type. So for that purpose right here DF space hyphen capital T and hit enter. So here if you see under the file system here we have slash dev slash sda3 and in front of it under the type we have ext4. So basically this is my file system and currently my system is using this particular one. Some of the other purposes of the file system includes the disk storage because the file system offers the space for the non-volatile storage of data. The file system also provides the namespace, a naming and an organizational methodology. And this phenomena defines that how a file can be named and the arrangement of the data on the disk. Modern file system nowadays provides the security model as well. It is a schema defining access rights to the files and directories. It is similar to the authorization in software systems. Well, the file system ensures that a particular user can access only their files. For example, when we create different files and directories, we assign different permissions to different users. So file system makes sure that only those users are able to access those files and directories that are assigned to them and that are permitted to them. So that was all about the purpose of file system and these were some of the features of the file system and that's it for this video. In this video we'll talk about how to check free space a disk have. Well I'll show you two ways. First one is from the GUI and the second one will be from the terminal. First of all just search for the disks in your Linux distribution. After that open your disk and here you can see here I have a partition. If you just click on it, here you will see the information about the free space available and the used as well. So here I have three partitions basically and if I click on any one of these here it says 531 megabytes free. It means 1.2% have been used only. If I just click on the third one, here it says 31.7% is full or 31.7% have been used till now and 29 gigabytes of its free. First one is the partition one and it is for the system. So here we do not have any information. So this is one of the ways that you can follow. Now I'll show you the other one. First of all, just write here df into your terminal and hit enter. So here if you see, here we have our partitions and we have information about the total memory used and the available. But if you see, this is not in the readable form or you cannot determine if you are a new user that how much gigabytes or megabytes is available or free. Well, for that purpose, we have another command as df space hyphen h and hit enter. And here if you see now, my SDA3 is 39 gigabyte in total size, used is 12 gigabytes and still available is 25 gigabytes. So total that have been used till now is 32%. Then I have SDA2 which is 512 megabyte in size. In case if you want to know about the free disk space about a particular partition, you can do so. For example, here you can see this is my primary partition and this is the path 
So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to write here df space hyphen h space slash dev slash sda3 hit enter. Okay, here I have to write dev not deck. So I'll write here dev hit enter. Here it says 39 gigabyte total, 12 gigabytes used and 25 gigabytes is available. Now in case if you want to get the more detailed information, we have another command as df space hyphen a hit enter. Here you can see we have a detailed information about the disk and how much is available and how much have been used. So this is how you can find out about the free disk space available in your Linux distribution. And that's it for this video. In this video, we'll talk about how to check number of disks. Well, there are several commands that we can use into our Linux terminal. First of all, I'll write here lsblk that stands for a list block. Hit enter. So here, if you see here, we have three disks that are available into my system. And these are SDA1, SDA2 and SDA3. Other than that, we can also use ls block space hyphen f. If I hit enter, with this command, our disk will be listed onto our terminal and along with that, the partition and the file system will also be there. So here you can see for SDA3, we have ext4. For SDA2, we have vfat file system. Other than this command, we have another command and that is sudo space hwinfo. Basically, you have to install hwinfo in your system if you have not. After that, give it a space and write here hyphen hyphen disk and hit enter. It will also give you the information about the number of disks, their sizes into your system. Well, this information is very hard to read. So what I can do here, I can use the same command and at the end of it, give it a space one more time and write here hyphen hyphen short and now hit enter. So now it will only show you the number of disks into your system. So here, this is the folder and here I have my number of disks. Other than that, we can have another way that we can follow and that is to look at the dev slash disk folder. The command for that is ls space hyphen l space slash dev slash disk and hit enter. Here you can see we have by id and by uuid. If you want to see the number of disk used by id and if you want to see the number of partition used by uuid. In my case, I'm going to use the same command but at the end of it, I'll write here by id because I want to know about the number of disks hit enter. And here if you see, I only have one primary partition and one primary disk. Now I'll just close this one and now at the end of it, just search for disk into your Linux distribution, hit enter. And on the left hand side, you will see the number of disks that are available into your system. At the moment, I only have one disk that is available and in that particular disk, I have different partitions. So these are some of the ways that you can follow to find out the number of disks into your system. And that's it for this video. In this video, we'll talk about the package manager. And as I'm using Ubuntu, so I'll stick with APT and Deb. Well, as Ubuntu's package management system is derived from the same system that is used by the Debian or Gnu Linux distribution. So that is why Debian package files typically have the extension as .deb. And usually they exist in a repository that are collection of packages found online or on physical media. If I talk about the APT, APT stands for Advanced Package Tool. It is a user interface that works with core libraries to handle the installation and removal of software on Debian and Ubuntu and the other Linux distributions as well. And this user interface or this interface simplifies the process of managing softwares on your system by automating the process and it also configure and install the software packages. Either you can use pre-compiled files or you can compile your source code. Now I'll show you that how we can use and how we can download and install some of the packages. Well, I'll use APT. You might have seen that whenever we try to update, upgrade or when we try to install some of the applications or software, we use some of the command. For example, if I write here sudo apt space install space htop. So basically I'm trying to install htop 
and apt will do that if i hit enter enter your password it will start the process of downloading all the packages that are related to htop and then it will install it apt not only install the packages it also gets used to remove them as well so what i'm going to do i'm going to show you that how you can remove your htop so for that purpose we'll just write here sudo apt remove htop sudo for administrative privileges apt is telling to remove htop so if i hit enter what it's going to do it's going to ask me to confirm it and then it will remove the htop from my system same goes for other libraries packages and other softwares and applications for example this time i'll write here sudo apt install and map hit enter and again it will do the same process and it will install all the packages that are related to nmap so this is how apt package manager work and this is how you can download and install different things in the next videos i'll further discuss about the packages and how we can manage them and what they are in actual i'll see you in the next one in this video we'll talk about installing and removing software well we have two ways that we can follow in order to install or remove any software or application first one is by using graphical user interface and second one is through the terminal so this is my ubuntu software center or it is just like the windows store from where we can download different software and applications for free so i'll just open my ubuntu software and in here i can search for any software that is available in ubuntu repositories so let's search for vlc and let's see if we have vlc available or not so here we do have vlc i'll just click on it now in order to install it i'll just click on this install button and then it will ask me about my password after that it will start the installation process as you can see as we are almost done with 11 percent so we are done here with the installation and now i'll just minimize this and i'll show you that how you can download and install different softwares from your terminal well the command to install any software or package is sudo apt that is package manager then you have to write install then write the name of the software that you want to install or you can write the name of the package that you want to install i'll show you that how you can download and install a utility that is called as htop hit enter give it your password hit enter now your terminal will start the process to download all the packages that are needed for your software your package or your application that you want to download after that you are good to go let me clear my terminal now i'll show you that how you can install winrar in your ubuntu so the command for that is sudo apt install space unrar in ubuntu it is called as unrar and hit enter now here you can see it has started to download all the needed packages and then it has installed everything and we are good to go now if i search for vlc into my system i do have vlc and will also have our winrar now i'll show you that how we can uninstall any software so again i'll show you both ways so from the terminal use the same command that you have used to install any software but instead of writing install just write here remove and hit enter it will remove everything that you have installed till now in terms of your software now from your gui interface or your ubuntu software as you can see here is my vlc media player just search for any application that you have installed into your system and open it like this and then just click on this delete button and it will uninstall this application or software from your system so this is how you can install and remove software and different applications from your linux distributions and that's it for this video in this video we'll talk about searching and updating the packages while well, i'll show you two ways that you can follow first one will be from the terminal and second one will be from a package manager well first of all just write here apt list into your terminal and hit enter it will show you the list of all the packages in your system whether they are installed or uninstalled it means it will show you everything now if i write here apt space list space hyphen hyphen installed and hit enter 
it's going to show me only those packages that are installed into my system or let's say I want to check if a particular package is installed into my system or not for that purpose I have a command as apt space list space hyphen a space write the name of the package that you want to look if it is installed or not I want to look for Apache 2 hit enter well if it was installed there would have been installed written in front of this package now what if I want to see only those packages that are upgradable or there is an upgrade and update available for some particular packages for that purpose the command is apt list space hyphen hyphen upgradable and hit enter it will show you the list of those packages that can be upgraded so how cool it is now we have another way that we can follow and that is I'll write here apt search space I will write the name of the package I'll write here genome hyphen mpv hit enter this command will look for the package into my system and it will check if it is available or not now I'll use another command that will use show insert of apt hit enter this command will show you different commands that you can follow in order to install this particular package now I'll show you another way if I write here apt space show now if I write the name of any package let's write here celluloid and hit enter what this command is going to show me it's going to show me the more details about this package if I scroll up here you can see here we have the package its version priority section origin and many other things so these are some of the ways that you can follow in order to install different packages or you can search for different packages using simple commands other than that we can install a package manager I would recommend you to download and install synaptic package manager that is really great for your Ubuntu operating system so if I write here sudo apt install space synaptic well I have already installed it but I'm just going to show you that how you can install it hit enter and here it says zero upgraded zero newly installed zero to remove and 15 not upgraded well basically I have already installed it if I just search for it here it is I'll just open this one well this is a utility or you can say this is a user interface of package manager that you can use or you can follow in order to search for any particular package into your Ubuntu so this is how it looks like and this is the list that you can go through and here you can have different packages to install for example if I just click on this one and if I click on mark for installation I'll just mark it scroll down I can mark any other one as well just like this one I'll just click on mark and after you are done with everything what you can do you can install all of them with one simple click by just clicking on this apply button in case if you want to search for a particular package here we have a search button just click on it and write the name of the package and here we have a different repositories in which we can search for that particular package so how cool and how easy it is that we can use a particular GUI application to manage our packages and that brings us to the end of this video I'll see you in the next one so in this video we'll talk about processes in Linux well first of all in case if you want to list out the processes just write here PS and at the moment only two processes are running first one is bash and second one is PS this is the ID of process this is the time and here we have the CMD well in case if you want to list out all the processes that are running at a particular time into your system just write here ps space aux and hit enter these are all the processes that are running let me go to the top and I'll explain everything this is the user and most of the time you will see two major users as root and second one will be your username which is Zubair in my case as you can see most of the processes are running by user which are root and Zubair other than that we have some other information in here as well this is the process ID this is the percentage of CPU that each process is using 
then the percentage of memory. This is the start time and here is the time for which this process got running. Then we have the command for each process. And if you keep scrolling down, you will see all the processes that are running at this particular time. Let me open my Mozilla Firefox, but before that, let me increase the size of my terminal. And now I'll open my Mozilla Firefox. So here is our Mozilla Firefox. Let me go back to my terminal. And now if I write and use the same command again, at the end, if you see here, we have processes for our Firefox running. So all those processes will appear here that you will use or that you will open. So if I open my file explorer, that process will be added in this list. So this is how you can see all the processes that are running into your system. Now let's see, I'll write here ps space hyphen u space root. What it will do, it will show me only those processes that are running by the root user hit enter. So here we have all the processes that root user is running. Let's do the same command and let's write here Zubair this time hit enter. So here we have Firefox that is being used under the user Zubair. And other than that, we have some other processes like VBox client, which means virtual box. And we have many more processes. Now I'll talk to you about that how we can stop a particular process. For example, if I write here sudo apt install vlc, I'll give my password. And let's say I want to cancel this process out. So either I can click on this cross button to close my terminal, but this is not an appropriate thing to do. Other than that, we have a shortcut and that shortcut is control C. In some of the cases, this shortcut is, for example, if you want to get out of some file, the shortcut is control Z. For example, if I write here cat space angle sign, and then if I write here file, hit enter, I can write anything. And for example, now if I want to get out, so for these kind of things, we have to press control Z. So for some processes, there is a command as control C and for some control Z. But what if there is a process that is being stuck and it is not responding and I want to get out of this process or I want to kill that process. Well, luckily for that, we have a command. First of all, let me write here PS hyphen use where and here we have ID for Firefox. Let's say this Firefox is not responding and now I will kill it. The command for that is kill hyphen nine. Make sure to give a space. After that, write the ID of the process that you want to kill. So the process ID for Firefox is 2827. So as soon as I hit enter, you will see that this Mozilla Firefox will get closed. So that was all about the processes. And now I want to talk to you about a utility called as top. If I write here top, hit enter. Well, this is a by default utility and come in every Linux distribution. So this utility also telling us about the process ID, user of that particular process. And here it is telling us about the percentage of resources that are being used by each process at this current time. Then we have command. For example, this process is of genome shell. Then this is the top itself that is running at the moment. And on the upper section, if you see here, we have the total summary. We have tasks which are 199 in total. One is running, 197 are sleeping and one is stopped. And down here we have the summary. This is the total memory. This is the used one. And this is the free memory that is available. And this memory is under the buffer. Down here we have swappiness value and some other information. But if you see this information is not very sophisticated in terms of representation. So we have another thing that we can do. Just press control Z to get out of this. And this time I will write here edge top. Edge top doesn't come pre-installed with Ubuntu. We can install it with the command as sudo apt space install edge top and just hit enter. So here it is downloading and installing htop and I'll show you that how it is different from top. So we are done with the download and installation of htop utility. I'll write here htop. So here it is showing us and it is giving us the same information that top was giving. But now if you see this information is in more sophisticated form. We have swappiness value. We have memory information. We have total tasks. One is running and down here we have all the processes. 
so basically we have some of the things that we can also perform like we can use f9 to kill f10 to quit out of this and many more things so i'll just press f10 and let's just quit out of it and that was all about the processes in linux and how we can see and how we can go through different processes and that's it for this video in this video we'll talk about the processes their properties and we'll also talk about parent and child processes well a process is a program that is under the continuous execution and it includes some of the things like program counter registers program code process stack etc whenever we execute a command or we do some work in linux operating systems a process gets started some processes wait for the input for example if you install some packages software or application or you want to find out the current working directory or you use ls command or you use cd command some processes will be triggered and some processes will run continuously in the system these are mostly the background processes not only that every process has a unique id in the system that is called as process id or pid whenever a process gets started it gets an id as well with the help of that id we can track that process or let's say that process got stuck and you want to kill it so with the help of that id we can kill that process and no two processes can have the same process id let's talk about the parent and child processes well all the processes in linux gets created when a process executes the fork system and those processes that execute the fork system are called as the parent processes and the parent process then creates the child process using that fork system a parent process can have multiple child processes but each child can have only one parent the process id of the child process gets returned to the parent process you might have some experience using some of the programming languages when we use nested for loops nested if else or nested case statements that creates parent child processes because one loop returns the output to the upper loop and then the upper loop gets executed so this is the phenomena of child and parent processes and in the next videos i'll talk to you about in detail about different processes how you can start a process how you can kill it how you can analyze that how many resources a process is using a particular time so i'll see you in the next video in this video we'll talk about how to start the process well there are two types of processes first one are foreground processes and the second one are background well foreground processes are those processes that takes the input from the keyboard and sends the output on the screen and they always run on the foreground second types of processes which are background processes does not require to have input from the keyboard for example antivirus it runs in the background and with background processes we can do anything else as well for example if you want to do some other operations or if you want to run some other processes you can do so unlike the foreground processes where we have to wait for the process to get complete and only then we'll be able to start a new process now i'll show you an example let me open my terminal and in here i'll write pwd well this is the foreground process it took input from me and it has shown me the output on the screen now there is another command that is pwd space and sign now if i hit enter this process is the background process and it will keep on working on the background in case if you want to see all the processes that are running into your system just write here ps and hit enter so at the time i only have two processes first one is bash and the second one is ps so as soon as i have written ps here and hit enter a new process was started that was ps now if i write here ps space hyphen f i'll get the same information but now it will be in more detail so now as you can see we have more information in here so this is how you can start a process if i write here sudo apt install update or if i remove update still it will work what it will do it will start a new process into my system 
but this is foreground process so until unless it gets complete i cannot do anything else there is only one way that i can do anything else and that is i have to stop this process otherwise i cannot do anything now if i write here ps so here again we only have two processes so this is how you can start a process and this is how you can list out all the processes that are running into your system let's talk about how to monitor the processes well there is a command as ps space aux hit enter it will show you the list of all the processes that are there into your linux distribution and here if you see we have root and you will also see zubair in here as well this is the user of each process as you can see you have root zubair our ticket and we have some other here as well other than the user of each process we have process id percentage of cpu that are being used by each process then the memory and then we have the start time of each process and the total time here till when the process ran and here we have the command of each process this is one of the way that you can follow to monitor the processes other than that we have another command as cat space slash proc slash mem info basically memory info if you hit enter this command will give you the detailed information about the total memory in your system memory that is free that is available memory that have been used by buffers then the memory that have been used by cache and many other things this is another way other than that we have a utility here as well and that is stop if you just write here top hit enter it will open a window like this here if you see we also have some of the processes that are running this is the process id this is the user and here we have the percentage of cpu and memory that is being used by each process in here and if you notice these processes are sorted by the number of resources each of them are using as you can see at the top we have a process that is using the maximum amount of cpu and memory then comes the process that is using less memory than the first one and list goes on here other than the top we have another utility that is called as htop but make sure to install it into your system so the command for that is sudo apt install space htop hit enter it is the same utility just like the top but it is more sophisticated than the top so i'll just write here htop hit enter so here if you see we have the same information but now it is in more sophisticated way so that was all about the htop now i'll just get out of this and here i'll use a command let me clear my terminal this is the command that i'm going to use what this command will do this command will sort all the processes that are running into my system and then it will sort them on the base of memory and resources that are being used by each one of them if i hit enter so here you can see we have on the top with 5.8 and 0.9 percent then we have a process with 5.5 1.6 1.4 so you can see that this list have been sorted in descending order so this is how you can monitor your processes and this is how you can find out the processes that are consuming memory on the higher level and that was all about this video in this video we'll talk about how to kill a process well there are several ways that you can follow to kill a particular process for example let me open my rhythm box now what i can do i can write kill all after that a name of the application which is rhythm box hit enter it will kill this application if i write here top hit enter these are the different processes and here we have the id what i'm going to do i'm going to copy this id this is 19675 after that i'll get out of this and i'll write here kill 19675 hit enter this command will kill this particular process now if i write here top you will see i do not have that particular process in here well that was all about the processes that are responsive and we are not talking about those particular processes that are unresponsive or get stuck in the system i'll show you that how you can kill such processes as well now if i write here pid of space after that i can write the name of the application or the name of the process to find out its id 
let me open my rhythm box once again and here I'll write rhythm box hit enter this command will return me the process ID of this particular process let's just copy this particular process ID and write here kill space and let's paste the command either you can paste it or you can write it manually the process ID is 19678 after that hit enter this will also kill your processes now let's talk about such processes that are unresponsive for example if i write here sudo apt install vlc hit enter i will give my password and now if i press y hit enter and now if i just kill this process or terminate this process with the help of control z command now if i try to write here sudo apt update hit enter and after that if i write here upgrade here you can see it says waiting for cache lock could not get lock as we stop the vlc media installation and because of that we had a process that is locked and because of that we cannot do anything else and this is such type of process that is unresponsive now i'll show you that how you can delete or how you can kill that type of processes we'll use the same command as kill but this time we'll use a flag as hyphen 9 and after that just write the process id of the process that is unresponsive and in our case it is 19753 and now if i hit enter you will see this process will be killed here it says operation not permitted because we have to use sudo along with it as well and we have successfully deleted this process now if i try to upgrade my system i'll not have any problem as you can see so this was all about that how you can kill the process from your terminal now i'll show you that how you can do that from your gui application i'll look for a system monitor here it is i'll just open that one and after that go to your processes and these are all the processes that are running into your system now what i'm going to do i'm going to right click on this bash process and here we have an option that says kill i'll just click on kill and i'll click on kill process so as you can see we do not have our terminal anymore and you can do the same with all the processes that are here into our system monitor so this is how you can kill your processes either from your terminal or from your system monitor and that's it for this video in this video we'll talk about control services and demons well as we know that we have a command as ps space hyphen aux if i hit enter here you can see here we have a lot of services but we also know that most of them are running on their own and we haven't started any one of these. Why is that so and why we have all of these services and why do we have so many of them? Well, most of them are demons and they are running on their own in the background. Well, if you are from the Windows background, you might have an idea about the services. It is just like that. Just like in Windows, we have different services that run in the background to complete different operations. We have daemons in Linux distributions to complete different processes. For example, some daemons work on your SSH, some helps you out in your printing, some helps you out in your networking. And just like that, we have many daemons for different purposes. Now, the question is that how we can find out if the service is daemon or it is a service in actual. Well, I'll use a command as ps space hyphen aux. Now I'll use a pipe as grep space. I'll write here ssh. If I hit enter, you can see that we have ssh and then we have d at the end of it. Here, 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 and then we have here and here as well. Well, anywhere a service that ends with a d, it means it's a daemon service. And that indicates that the service is daemon itself and not the actual service and most of the time it runs in the background well now we know that this is a daemon service but what if i want to know what is the main daemon service or what is the parent daemon service for that purpose we have a command as ps3 hit enter if i scroll up here you will see that we have system and at the end of it we have d it means this system d is the parent daemon and all of these are child of this particular process or service so now you know that what is the parent daemon into our system now 
what if I want to start, I want to stop, or I want to check the status of a particular daemon. For that purpose, we use systemctl. So first of all, I'll write here sudo systemctl space. Now I'll write here start space name of the daemon, which is sshd in my system. I'll hit enter. Now what I'll do, I'll stop it. I'll write here stop, hit enter. Now let's check the status of our SSHD. So I'll write here status, hit enter. Here you can see at the active state, it is inactive. It means it is not working. Now let's restart it. So for that purpose, either you can write here start or you can write here start, hit enter. Now let's check the status again. And now this daemon or the service is up and running. So this is how you can control your demons and services and this was the main difference between demons and services in our Linux distribution and that's it for this video. In this video we'll talk about how to start and stop services. Well if I write here sudo space ifconfig this command will return me my IP address. This is my IP address what I'm going to do I'm going to just copy this one. Now I'll open my browser and here I'll paste that IP address. Now if I hit enter, I do not have anything on my web browser. Now let's head back. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to start my Apache service. So I'll write here sudo service space Apache2 space start. Hit enter. What I have done here, I have started my Apache2 service. Well, basically Apache 2 doesn't come pre-installed in Ubuntu, you have to install it. So I have installed it manually in my system. And here you can see now our Apache 2 default page is here and it means our service is up and running. Now I'll make this example a little bit more interesting. What I'm going to do, I'm going to use my Python in order to host my files onto this browser or you can say onto this address. So first of all, what I'll do here, I'll write a command as sudo space python space hyphen m space http dot server. After that here I have to define a port number. Basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to paste or I'm going to host all of my files into my system onto this particular IP address and I'll be able to access it from this browser. After that, here I have to write a port number. You can write any port number as per your liking. I'll go with 400. In my system, I have Python 3. Now I'll hit enter. And here it says already in use because I have already configured it and it is up and running. Now what I'll do here, I'll just add 400 after adding a colon. After that, if I hit enter now, and here you can see I have all the directories and have all the files in here. If I go to my desktop here, I'll have a file that is hidden. Then we have documents, we have downloads, then we have music directory, pictures directory, public and other directories here as well. And these are all the hidden files that start with dot. So this is how you can start and stop any service into your Linux distributions. Now I'll show you that how you can stop that service. The command to stop your service is sudo space service space apache2 space stop and hit enter this command will stop apache2 service and after that let's check its status so instead of writing here stop i'll write here status hit enter and here it says inactive now let's reload this page and let's see if it works or not and here you can see it says unable to connect because as soon as we have stopped our service, we cannot have a connection onto our browser. So this was all about this video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we'll talk about configure services to start automatically at the boot. Well, in this video, I'll show you that how you can write a script or how you can create a script that will run automatically on the boot up of your system. So first of all, what we need to do, we need to create a startup script. You can create that script anywhere in your system, but I'll create it into my particular directory. So I'll write here sudo nano space slash user slash local slash sbin 
and here I'll have my script file. You can name your script file anything. I'll name it as my underscore script dot sh. Hit enter. In this file, we do not have anything. Now, just get out of this file. And now we have to give this file execution permission. So for that purpose, I'll write here sudo space chmod space plus x. After that, path to that file, which is user local as bin and after that my script dot sh hit enter now we are good to go after this step we have to create a simple system d unit file because the script or the service that we are going to make run at the boot up time will run with the help of system d so for that purpose we have to create a system d unit file so i'll write here sudo space nano space slash etc slash system d slash system after that slash write the name of your script and that is my underscore script in my case after that as we are going to create a service that is why i'll write here service here we have three sections first one is unit that says description and it says my startup it means whenever the system starts then comes the service it means what to do when system gets start as it says exec start well it says when the system gets start execute this file after that at the end we have install we have another section and in this section it will get executed for all the users in the system now i'll just get out of this and now we are done with everything at the end of it we have to check the status of the service that we have just created so i'll write here sudo space system ctl space status after that write the name of the service that we have just created and that was my underscore script dot service hit enter here it says active inactive state it means the activation state of my service is inactive let's get out of this and let's just activate this service so i'll write here sudo space system ctl space start my underscore script dot sh and hit enter okay here i have to write service not sh so i'll write here service hit enter so we have successfully started our service well you might be wondering that what type of work we want to achieve with this script or with the service that we have just created well if i go back into my myscript.sh file here i have used hdpalm what it will do it will keep the backup of my system so basically this is the service that i want to achieve with the service that i have just created and that was all about this video and this is how you can make your services to run at the boot time Yes, there are particular services that are already available. You can also configure them to run at the startup time. But in this video, I had shown you that how you can create your own service and how you can make the service to run at the startup time. I'll see you in the next video. In this video, we'll talk about the slash dev and slash proc directories. Well, Linux and Unix like operating systems follow a certain file system and this is called as file system hierarchy standard. This standard also defines the structure of the file system in a particular operating system. It also defines the directories and the content in all of these directories. Slash dev and slash proc are the directories that comes under the file system hierarchy standard. The dev directory consists of files that represent the devices attached to the local system. And these are the files that user cannot read or write. In fact, these are the special files or device files. And these files are the abstraction of the devices that the applications interact with through the IO system or input output system calls. And these files are of two categories, block special files and character special files. Here I'm into my Ubuntu and here if I go to my dev directory and hit enter. Now let's ls here. These are all the files that comes under this particular directory. 
and here we have some special files that we can go through. So basically all of these files have the information about the devices or the applications that got interacted with the local system through the input output system calls. So as you can see we have some logs here then we have some reports in here and we have some other information in here as well. Let's ls space hyphen l here and here we have all the files and their details and if you see we do not have any execution permission for any type of user either its owner group or other type of user in fact in most of the files other type of user doesn't even have read or write permission here now if i talk about the proc directory well it is also known as the proc file system it contains the hierarchy of the special files that represent the current state of your kernel and that allows the users and the applications to peer into the kernel view of our system under the linux all the data gets stored as files and most of the users are only familiar with two types of files text files and binary files but in proc directory we have another type of files and it is called as virtual files and this is the reason that proc is also referred to as virtual file system now here if i cd into my proc directory and hit enter let's ls here so these are all the files and now let's search for a particular file i look for meminfo so for that i'll write here ls space hyphen l space i'll use a pipe and after that i'll write here grep space mem info hit enter so here we do have a file with the name of mem info so these are certain files just like mem info we have some other file as well as i have mentioned earlier this time let's search for mount we do have mount available let's look for interrupts if we have available or not hit enter yes we do have interrupts available well these are the certain files that will allow you to have the latest look in your systems kernel and all of these files have the hierarchy and they represent certain information so that was all about the dev and proc directories and what are their purposes and what type of content they possess and that's it for this video in this video we'll talk about the system documentation under the slash user slash share slash doc directory well this particular directory possesses the shareable text file that are architecture independent it means the content in this directory or the files in this directory can be shared with and by all the machines irrespective of the architecture of the hardware and mainly the user slash share slash doc directory contains the files that are related to the packages that we have installed or already installed in the system and sometimes this directory contains the information that you might not find anywhere else i'll show you an example as well other than the packages related files this directory also contains the configuration files and templates for certain utilities and that makes the configuration much easier now i'll cd into my user slash share slash doc directory if i ls slash l here these are the different directories that are available in this particular directory as you can see all of these are directory let me come down and let's go into one particular one as you can see we also have the x wayland and you might have an idea of what wayland is so i'll just cd into my x wayland directory let's hit enter now if i ls hyphen l here here i have two of the files first one is change log dot debian and then i have the copyright file so if you remember i told you that we have the information about the configuration some packages and some other things and here we have the copyright file if i open this copyright file you might be surprised to see that how much information this particular file possesses and as i have mentioned earlier that we might find the information in this particular directory that we might not find anywhere else so here we have all the information about the copyright here you can see this following is the standard copyright agree upon the most contributors and then we have the different information here we have the copyright and not only that 
there we have the information that you might not find on the official website as well. So this is the directory and this is how it works and this is the kind of data this particular directory possesses and that's it for this video. In this video we'll talk about awk and sed command. Well awk command is a scripting language that gets used for manipulating the data and generating some reports. The awk command programming language requires no compiling and it allows the users to use different variables, functions, and different logical operators. And AWK is a utility that also enables the programmer to write tiny but effective programs in the form of statements that define text patterns that you need to search in each line of the document. I'll show you an example of it as well. Here I have a file with the name of my file and if I open this one, here I have some data in it. As you can see, I have seven lines of data and each line have four columns. Now let's print this out onto our terminal. So I'll write here cat space, my file, hit enter. So here I have the data. Now I'll use my awk command. So if I write here awk space, single inverted commas and inside our single inverted commas, I'm going to use my print statement. So I'll just write here print and after my inverted commas, I'll write the name of the file, which is my file, hit enter. It is also showing us the same information that we were getting from the cat command. Well, as I haven't used any arguments along with my awk command, that is why we are getting the same information. Now, I'll write here awk space single inverted commas and inside that I'll have my slash, I'll write here manager. After that, again, I'll have my slash space curly braces and inside that I will ask my awk to print after that name of the file which is my file now what I want to do here I want to print out only those lines that have manager in it if you see we have a manager in line 1 in line 3 and in line 7 if I hit enter here if you see we have manager from line 1 and line 7 it has ignored line 3 this is because in line 3, the manager is with capital M. So make sure what you want to search for because AWK will only give you the result that you are looking for particularly. It will surely consider the case sensitivity. Now let's do something else in here. I'll write here AWK space curly braces and inside my curly braces, I'll write here print dollar sign one comma dollar sign four after that, I'll have my file name. If I hit enter, here you see it has only printed out particular line number. Basically, it has printed out line number one and then it has printed out line number four. Or if I say the column number four and one, it wouldn't be wrong. So this is how you can also specify that for which line you want to print out the data. Let's write here awk space inverted comma then inside that I'll have my print statement and I'll write here print space dollar sign zero name of my file hit enter what it will do it will print out everything that I have into my file dollar sign zero indicates everything and every line I'll use the same command but this time I'll use one flag with it and that is nr if I hit enter now it will print out the line number along with the data as well as you can see we have one two three four and each line number with every line at the end of it for the last example i'll write here awk space inverted commas and inside that i'll write here nr equal equal two comma nr equal equal five after that, I'll start my print statement. For that purpose, I have to use my curly braces. Inside my curly braces, I'll write here print nr colon dollar sign zero because I want to consider all the data and all the line into my file. That is why I have written dollar sign zero. If I hit enter, what it will do, it will show me the data from line number two to line number five. If I hit enter, so here if you see, we have the data from line number two to line number five and dollar sign zero indicates that show every column or every data in these particular lines. 
so this is how you can use your awk command in your terminal and this is how you can perform different operations with it now i'll talk about scd command let me clear my screen i'll use the same file that is my file well scd command is called as streamline editor and it lets you to edit files with commands and there is no need for a text editor for it as well now first of all what i'm going to do here i'm going to write here sed space after that my inverted commas and in that i'll have my s then you should write here slash i'll write here manager again i'll put my slash in here and i'll write here interni after that again i'll have my slash then i'll write here g after that i'll write the name of my file which is my file well what does s and g mean well s mean substitute and g mean globals it means substitute this word with this one globally means wherever this word is in the document change this word with this one that is interni and this is the file name if i hit enter here if you see and if you remember in line one and in line seven we had manager but now it has changed everything to interni and now we have interni in line one and in line seven we still have manager in line three because this manager starts with capital m now i'll show you another example of scd and i'll show you that how you can change a particular line data that start with a particular word so what i'm going to do here i'm going to write here sed space inverted commas again i'll write here s slash and this time we have to use our cap arrow which is like this one after that write here the word with which a line is starting i'm going to change the data in the line number two that start with ali after that again give it a slash and write the name or write the word that you want to change here i'll write here finch after that again we have to write here our slash then g for global and again we have to call our file which is my file enter so here if you see now ali have been changed with finch so this is how you can change those lines that start with a particular word or particular data and this is how you can use your sed command so i'm sure now that now you have an idea that how awk and sed command works and that's it for this video i'll see you in the next one in this video i'll talk to you about grep and regular expression to analyze the text well grep comes under the regular expression so that is why i'll start with the regular expression well regular expression helps us to find the data and match the complex patterns in our data and in our files and in directories there are different things that comes under the regular expression for example tr vi sed command grep command etc first of all if i write here cat space my file let me go to my desktop first so i'll write here cd desktop if i write here cat space my file so here i have the data that is here into this file now i'll use the regular expression and particularly grep to show you some of the data and examples so first of all if i write here cat space my file and along with that i'll use regular expression in order to use regular expression with my cat command i have to use a pipe so i'll write here grep now and now if i write here a hit enter what it's gonna do it's gonna show me all those line that contains a and all the characters that are in the red color are a now i'll show you that how you can make sure that your grep command or regular expression ignore the case sensitivity while well, i use the same command but this time i'll use a flag along with it and that flag is hyphen i now if i hit enter it will show me the line that contains david in it no matter if it is with capital d or small d now i'll use the same command but this time i'll write here hyphen c this will give me the count of line in which we have david we do not have any line that contains david with small d now i'll change it with capital d if i hit enter now well we do have one line in which we have david and it is only one line other than the grep command we have other expression under the regular expression for example we can generate different sequences we can generate different list etc 
if I write here echo and inside my curly braces, if I write here A, 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 then comma, then three times B, then comma, then three times C, then comma, then three times D. And now if I hit enter, here it has printed the exact thing. Now let's write here echo and inside my curly braces, if I write here A dot dot Z, and now if I hit enter, it will print out the complete alphabets. As you can see, it starts with A and ends at Z. So this is how you can print out a sequence. Now let's change the sequence and let's print out a range of numbers. I'll go to 1 to 100. If I hit enter, here we have 1 to 100 characters or numbers onto my screen. Let's have another expression. This time I'll write here 0 to 9 or 10 let's say and here I'll write A and at the end of it I'll write here Z. If I hit enter here what it has done it has taken A and Z as the constant input and it has changed the number from 0 to 10 with every input in here. So as you can see it starts with 0 and ends at 10. So this is how you can find out different things you can create different sequences and list. At the end of it, I'll show you an example. If I go back to my home directory and if I write here CD space and the directory that I want to go in is dev. If I enter, if I ls here, so here if you see we have different files and directory. Let's say I want to look for a particular directory or a particular file but I cannot find it in here or it is very difficult to find out as I have thousands of files. Well, for that purpose, I can use the grep command here as well. Well, as we know that we use ls l here for the detailed information about all the files. But now I'll show you that how you can use regular expression along with your ls command to find out a particular file. So I'll write here ls space hyphen l. And as you know that when we want to use some regular expression, we have to use pipes. So I'll write here pipe grep. And this time I'll write the name of the file that I want to look for. I want to look for mapper. If I hit enter, here we have the exact file that called mapper and it also ensures that we do have a file that we were looking for. In case if you do not know the full name, you can also write initials of any particular file and any file that has these initials as MAP will be here in front of you. So how cool and how easy it is that with the help of regular expressions, we can analyze our text, we can find out particular files, directories into our system as well. So I hope now that now you have an idea that how we can use a regular expression and how they are beneficial. And that was all about this video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we'll talk about how to archive, compress, unpack or uncompress file using tar, zip, gzip, star, etc. Well, first of all, if you see, I have some of the files onto my desktop and I have a directory or a folder as well. This is my zip file or tar file. I'll just delete this one. Now I'll show you that how you can zip more than one file or how you can zip or how you can convert your directories into tar files. First of all, let's head to our desktop. After that, here, I'll use a command as star space hyphen cf space here will give the name that we want to keep for our zip file. You can name it anything. I'll name it as Linux. After that we have to give the extension as well and the extension here is dot tar. After that give it a space and write here the name of the directory that you want to zip or you want to tar. I'll give the name of my Zubat directory and now if I hit enter you will see that we have a new tar file onto our desktop and this is how it looks like. If I open this one, you will see I have a folder which is Zubair and if I open this, I have four files into that one. Now let's just close this one and now I'll convert this tar file into gz file or gzip file. For that purpose, I'll use a command as gzip space name of your tar file which is linux.tar. If I hit enter now, this file will be converted into .gz extension. Here if you see, now we have linux.tar.gz. If I open this, here again I have my Zubair folder and here again I have four of these files. Now what if I want to uncompress all of these files? Well for that purpose, again I have to use tar command. 
and the command is star space and here I'll use flag as hyphen zxvf. After that, give it a space and write the name of the file, which is linux.tar.gz in my case. And after that, you just need to hit enter. It will uncompress it and it will show you the content of this particular file. Here you can see we have a directory and here we have all these files that we can go through. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to show you another way that you can use in order to zip and unzip your content of your files and your directories. First of all, let's clear our terminal and this time I'll use zip. So I'll write here zip and after that give the name that you want to give to your zip file. Let's go with my underscore zip dot. After that, obviously we have to provide the extension which will be zip in our case. Give it a space and after that give the name of the directory that you want to zip or the files that you want to compress. I'll go with these three files. I'll write here file 1 space file 2 space file 3 so this is how you can compress more than one file if i hit enter here you can see now we have a zip file at the desktop and here we have all of these three files present in this particular zip file you can use the zip command for your directories as well let me clear everything from here and let me write here zubair if i hit enter here we'll have a new directory or a new file that will have a name as my zip okay it will not work because we have to change the name for our zip file because my underscore zip already exists so i'll write here my zip one now if i hit enter here we have another file that says my zip one dot zip and this is how you can use zip command to compress your file now you might be wondering that what if i want to uncompress all of these well, to uncompress your zip files, we have to use a command as unzip. How easy it is. After that, give it a space hyphen L. Give it a space again and write the name of your zip file that you want to unzip. So I'll write here my zip dot. Okay, here I have to write underscore as well. Dot zip. Hit enter. It will uncompress it. And here we have the content of our this particular directory. Or this particular folder now let's do the same for our my underscore zip one dot zip file hit enter and here we go here we have one file in this particular one so this is how you can compress uncompress archive or unarchive your files your directories using tar zip and different other tools and i hope now that now you have an idea that how you can unzip those files that you download from the internet because most of the time that you will download a particular file that will be in file.tor.gz format and to unzip these sort of files I have shown you that how you can use your tar command very easily and that's it for this video. In this video we'll talk about locate and interpret log files. Well first of all we need to go into our bash mode so for that purpose I'll write here sudo space bash into my terminal hit enter it will ask you about your password give it that and hit enter once again now we are into our bash mode well log files are files that contains the messages about the system including the services applications and the kernel running on it and we have different files in terms of the log and the location of that is cd space slash var slash log and hit enter here you can see we are into our log directory if i ls here these are the different files or these are the different log files that we can go through for example here you can see we have last log open vpn we have private and then here we have apache 2 which is a server and then we have here syslog as well now in this you will also find messages secure mail log cron boot.log as well these are all the different logs that present different messages. For example, here we have our boot.log. Here we have log file related to our VMware because I'm running my Ubuntu into my VMware. Then here we have our system log and all of other logs here as well. Now, first of all, let's go into one of these logs and let's see what does the information a particular log has. 
I'll go into my boot dot log. So for that purpose, I'll write here nano space boot dot log and hit enter. So here, if you see, this file contains all the information about my boot time, when I booted up this system, and how was the response from the system. Here it says genome display manager. This was the time. Down here, I have other modem manager, open BSD secure shell server, and many other information here as well. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to get out of this. In our logs, we have a service that is called as rsyslogd. And all the log files are controlled by that particular service. And that particular service is a daemon service. Now, this time, I'll go into my VMware slash network dot one dot log file. So for that purpose, I'll write here nano space VMware hyphen network dot one dot log if i hit enter well here we have the information about the execution of our vmware and what were the different operations that we performed as it says is already active and this was a time when we accessed this particular directory i'll just get out of this so these were some of the logs and this is how you can interpret them and this is how you can go to different directories here i'll use another command first of all let me go back and here I'll write systemd hyphen analyze. Let's see what do we get. Well, here if you see, we have the information from the system. And here it says startup finished in 13 seconds. Kernel was up for one minute. And here we have the user space information. Systemd is also a service. And basically, it's a daemon service. Let me clear my terminal. And that's it for this video. I hope now that now you know that what are the purposes of log files and what kind of log files you can have in your system. It also depends on the distribution of Linux that you are using that you can have different log files and I can have different log files. But the purpose of each log file is same. And that's it for this video. In this video, we'll talk about managing users and groups. Well, as we know that Linux is a multi-user operating system means more than one person may be logged in and actively working on a given machine simultaneously without any problem. But if we talk about the security concern, security wise it is not a good idea to allow users to share the credentials of the same account. In fact, the best practice is to have as many user accounts as per the number of people who want to access the system. At the same time, there are also chances that two or more users may need to share access to certain system resources such as different directories and files. User and group management in Linux allows us to accomplish both objectives. It is also possible that you can have different directories and you can make those directory to be accessible for more than one user. Each user can create its own directories and make it restricted to its own use and he or she can also make it possible for others to access that particular directory. That also comes under the Linux administration. An admin is responsible to make sure that authorization of different files and directories is placed right it need to be. Adding a new user in Linux involves dealing with an account other than our own that requires super user or it is also known as root privileges. Same applies to other user or group management tasks such as deleting account or group, updating different accounts and groups, and assigning different permissions to users and groups. There are different commands that we can use for this purpose. For example, add user is a command that gets used for adding a user to the system. User del gets used to delete the user. Add group gets used to add a new group. Del group gets used to remove a group. Then we have user mode that we use to modify the user account. Then comes the change and it gets used to change user password expiry information. So these are some of the commands and in the next video, I'll show you that how you can create different user, different groups, how you can delete a particular group or user and how we can have different permissions for different users and group as well. So I'll see you in the next video. In this video, I'll talk about switching user, running command as other users and sudo. Well, first of all, as we want to switch the user, I'll show you that how you can create a user as well. 
and we'll also add that user into our sudo list. So first of all, the command to add your user is sudo space add user, give it a space and write the name of the user that you want to create. I'll name my user as user1, hit enter. Here I'll have its password. You can keep your password anything. And here it says bad password. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to change the password. And here it says full name. You can name your full name anything. I'll go with Alex. Here it says room number. I'll say 123. For work phone, I'll again go 123. For home phone, I go with 456. You can leave these things as blank as well. Just keep on hitting enter and it will take you to the next step. Here I'll just leave it as it is and I'll just hit enter. And here it says is the information correct i'll press y and hit enter so here we have successfully created a user with the name user1 now here let's switch to the user that we have created the command for that is sudo space su space name of the user and that is user1 hit enter now if i write here pwd hit enter here if you see here it says home zubair and here if you see the name here it says user1 it means now we are working as user1 into our Linux distribution. Now let's see if we can run commands as this user. So let's write here sudo apt update, hit enter, give it the password, hit enter once again. And here if you see here it says user1 is not in the sudo file, this incident will be reported. It means we have not allowed or we have not given the permissions for this user to do those tasks that need sudo privileges. For that purpose, we have to add this user into sudoers list. So first of all, what we need to do, we need to exit from this user. So for that purpose, right here, exit. We are out of it and now we have Zubair as a user. Now I'll write here sudo space hyphen i because we need to go into root mode. Here we are. Now here I'll write sudo space vi sudo which is a file name. Hit enter, it will open a file for you. This is the file. Come to the end of this file and here we have the user. What I'm gonna do, I'm just going to copy this particular line and I'm just going to paste it down here. I'll just right click here, I'll just paste it and I'll change the username which is u1. I'll change it to user1. Now, make sure you write all equal all colon all and no password colon all. Now we need to save this file and to get out of this, just press Ctrl X and press Y and hit enter. Now I'll exit from my root and now I'll switch to the user1. So again I'll write here sudo su space user1 hit enter. Now let's see if we can run different commands in here or not. I'll run one sudo command and let's say if it can run the sudo privileges command or not. So I'll just write here sudo apt update hit enter. As you can see, now this user can run those commands that need sudo privileges because we have just added this user into sudo's list. So this was all about that how we can switch the users and how we can run different commands as other users. Now I'll just exit from it and I'll clear my screen and here I'll show you that how you can run commands without the need of sudo because if you remember or if you know that whenever we need to update, upgrade or we need to install anything into our system, we have to write sudo along with it. In case if you want to get rid of this, we have a solution and that is just right here sudo space hyphen i and hit enter. Now we are going to use the system as the root user and now we do not need to write sudo with every command. Now if I write here apt update. And you can see I haven't written sudo along with it. If I hit enter, this command will work because we are working as a root user. So that was all about this video and this is how you can switch user. This is how you can create new user. And this is how you can run command as other users as well. In case if you want to get out of your root user, just write here exit and hit enter. And it is log out. And that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we'll talk about modifying and deleting user account. Well, first of all, we have to go into our root mode. So I'll write here sudo space hyphen i, hit enter. So as we are into our root mode, and let's see if we have user1 available that we created in the previous video or not. The command for that is grep space 
user1 space slash etc slash password hit enter so here we do have user1 available this is the user id this is the group id and this is the other information if you remember when we were creating the user we added this information then this is the working directory of this user and here it has its bin slash bash if you have sbin slash no login it means this user will not be able to log in but we have allowed this user to log in into the system now i'll show you that how you can make these things as per your own liking for example you can assign the id to the user as per your own liking you can assign this user your own comment and many other things first of all if i write here user add hyphen u and here hyphen u mean user id you can give any id to the new user i'll give it as 55555 after that give it a space and write the name of the user that you want to create i'll name my new user as user2 hit enter and let's check into the etc slash password file so here if you see now here the user has the id as five times fives now let's use the same command and this time what i'm going to do i'm going to give my personalized comment for that purpose we use hyphen c and for the comment we have to use inverted commas and in that you can assign anything for example let's say this user that i'm going to create belongs to the it field so i will write here it department hit enter let's go into our etc slash password file okay here it says this user already exists we have to change the username i'll name it as user3 now let's use the grep command and go into the file and here you can see the comment is it department so this is how you can do that let's say i want to create a user and i want to have my personalized information for the user but i want to do it with a single command well for that purpose we can do so i'll write here user add hyphen c then i'll have my comment and after that i'll write here hyphen u and here i'll assign the id i will assign the id as one two three four five give it a space then the username i'll go with user four hit enter let's go into our grep and user four hit enter so here if you see here we have one two three four five as an id it department is still the same for user four and then we have sbin and sh now let's say i want to change the information for a particular user earlier we created the user with our own information but now i want to change the information for a user that already exists into my system for that purpose we have to use user mod give it a space now i'll write here hyphen c and then i'll have my comments i'll write here hr department and for whom i am changing this information i want to change this information for user 4 if you remember user 4 was earlier part of the it department hit enter now let's use the grep command so i'll write here grep and after that i'll write here user 4 and let's hit enter so here if you see now the user 4 is part of the hr department well now what if i do not want this user to be able to log in into the system well for that purpose i'll write here okay let's use the same command but let's use some different flag this time i'll write here hyphen s space slash s bin slash no login let's see if it works or not and i'm doing it for the user 4 hit enter now let's try to log in as user 4 if i write here su space user 4 hit enter here it says this account is currently not available to make sure that this user is able to log in back again you can change your arguments in here and this time i'll write here bin slash and after that i'll write here bash hit enter and let's try to log in yes we can log in with user 4 this time so this is how you can modify the information for your particular user now what if i want to delete a particular user well the method is really simple just right here user del space write the name of the user that you want to delete if i write here user 2 hit enter we have successfully deleted user 2 if i write here su user 2 hit enter it says does not exist 
Here we have another way that we can follow to delete a particular user and that is using a flag as hyphen RF and this time I'll write here user3. What this gonna do? This will also delete the user. R means forceful and F mean home directory. It means this command will remove the home directory of the user along with its account as well. Let's do the same for user4, hit enter. Now let's go to our home directory. So I'll write here cd home, hit enter. And now if I LL here, here you can see we do have user1 available, but its account has been deleted. But still we have its home directory available. So this is the difference between RF and only deleting the user simply if I write here user del space. But before that, let me go back to my root directory or my back directory. And here if I write user del space hyphen RF space user one hit enter where it says not found. And again, let's go to our home directory. Let's write here LL hit enter. And if you see here, we do not have user one anymore in here. So this is how you can modify a user account. And this is how you can delete the account as well. And that's it for this video. In this video, we'll talk about how to change the owner of a file. First of all, let's create the user. So I'll write here sudo user add space, write the name that you want to give to your user. I'll name my user as David, hit enter. Let's have the password for our David. So I'll write here P -A -S, S W D space David, hit enter. So here I'll write its password, hit enter and retype your password. So we are done with the password as well. Now let's have a directory onto our desktop. So first of all, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go to my desktop. Here it is. And here I'll create a new directory. So I'll write here mkdir space. You can name your directory anything. I'll name it as mkdir dir1. Hit enter. So here we have created a directory with the name of dir1. So again, I'll go back to my desktop and here I'll write ls space hyphen l. So here if you see dir1 has the user as Zubair and group is also Zubair. Now I'll show you that how you can change its group and its owner. To change the user of a particular directory or a file, we have a command as chown. Give it a space, write the name of the user that you want to assign. I want David to be the owner of this file. After that, give it a space and write the name of the directory or your file. In my case, it is directory one, hit enter. Okay, here it says operation not permitted. So for that purpose, we have to use sudo along with it. Now let's ls here. So here, if you see now the owner of this particular directory is David. Let's change the group of this directory as well, because I want David to be managing this particular directory not some other user. So for that purpose, as we are going to change the group, I'll write here change group, which is chgrp, give it a space, write the name of the user or the group that you want to assign, give it a space and write the name of the directory. In my case, it is directory one, hit enter. Okay, again, we have to use sudo along with it, hit enter and let's ls space hyphen l here. Now here you can see honor and the group are David this time. Now let's create a file this time onto our desktop and name it as file underscore one hit enter. Now let's ls space hyphen l here. So here if you see the owner and the group of my file one is Zubair, I'll change it. So again for user, I'll write here ch own space david space file name which is file underscore one hit enter. Okay again I'm making a mistake here we have to write sudo and we are good to go. Now let's change the group as well. So I'll write here chgrp, give it a space. After that, write the name of the user, which is David and file name, which is file one. And before that command, make sure to write sudo, hit enter. Now ls space hyphen l here. So here, if you see for both of our directories and files, David is the user and David is the group. And that's it for this video and this is how you can change the honor of your files, your directory and we also saw that how we can change the group of a particular file and a particular directory as well. So that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we'll talk about how to change the directory permissions.
First of all, let's head to our desktop and here I'll create a directory. Call right here mkdir space, name your directory anything. I'll name it as dir1, hit enter. So here if you see, we have successfully created the directory. Now if I ls space hyphen l here, here I want to show you that the owner and the group of this particular directory is where. Let's change the group or let's change the owner of this particular directory. I'll change the owner of this particular directory. So I'll write here ch on space who will be the user of this particular directory. I want root to be the owner of this particular directory. After that, write the name of the directory, hit enter. Okay, here again, we have to use sudo hit enter let's ls here now here owner of this particular directory is root now let's change the permission as you can see for the owner read write execution permission is there then for the group read write execution and for the other user only read and execution permissions are there let's change the permission for root user command for that is sudo space chmod space for user we use u and as we want to remove these permission of read write and execution so that is why i'll write here minus then write here rwx for read write execution give it a space write the name of the directory which is dir1 in my case hit enter now if i ls hyphen l here here you can see for the owner we do not have any particular permission no matter whoever the user is let's change the permission once again and this time I want my owner of this particular directory to have write and execution permission. So I'll write here wx enter. Let's ls here. So here we have write and execution permission. Now let's change the permission for the group which are read write execute. So for that purpose I'll use the same command but this time instead of u we have to use here g because g stands for group. After that, I want to remove it. So that is why I'll write here minus RWX. Minus will remove these three permissions. Hit enter. And here we do not have any permission for our group. Let's change the permission for other users. For other users, we use O. And I'll remove every permission for other user whatsoever. And here we have an error because other user only had read and execution permission and there was no write permission. But we tried to minus or we try to delete the right permission that is why we got the error now if i hit enter okay i have to use o instead of zero now hit enter now let's ls here and here we do not have any permission for other user now here i'll follow another way and that is i'll use the same command but instead of using these symbols i'll use absolute mode i'll write here 777 7 means all the permission for the owner, second 7 means all the permission for group and last 7 means all the permission for other user. If you remember from the previous videos, I told you that what does 1 mean, what does 2 mean, what does 3 mean, what does 4 mean. So I'll go with 777 and first 7 or first integer is for owner, second integer is for group and third integer is for other user. Hit enter, let's ls hyphen l here. So all the user, either its owner, group or other user have all the privileges and permissions to read, write and execute this particular directory. In terms of having a file and its permission, we'll use the same structure and same instruction. But instead of writing the name of the directory, we just have to write the name of that particular file. And that's it for this video. In this video, we'll talk about special permission mod in Linux. Well, as we all know that we have a file called as shadow. Let me go there. I'll write here ls space hyphen l space slash etc slash shadow hit enter. Well, this is the file. Whenever we change a password, this file gets updated or all the password gets stored into this particular file. But if you see here, we have read write permission for the owner, read permission for the group and no permission for other user. Then how so a user gets to change its password. For example, if I write here sudo passwd space david, what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to change the password for david. So if I write here password, retype its password and we have successfully updated this password. But here we do not have any privileges for david or for root to change this password. Then how come so 
that we are able to do so well this particular file has the privileges of super user identification that allows the other user to change the password for example if i write here where is pass wd file here it is if i go to this particular directory i'll write here cd space slash user slash bin hit enter if i ls space hyphen l here so here we have a file that is called l password and in that file let me look for that file first so here if you see here we have a file and here we have our ws permission but we haven't seen s permission before s permission is the permission for special identification and it is for the user and for the user you will also see rws instead of x it will be s it means that group will be allowed for every user to use and go through and execute so this is how a user is allowed to change the password whenever he or she required because this particular file that called as password has the privileges of special user identification you might be wondering that how we can allow a particular file to have this kind of permission well do not worry i'll show you just that let's go back and let's go to our desktop okay first of all let's clear our terminal and let's go to our desktop and here i'll create a file i'll write here touch space file one hit enter so here if you see we do have a file with the name of file one here what i'm gonna do i'm going to check its permission on file one we have read write permission for honor read write for a group and read permissions for other users now i'll change the permission i'll write here chmod space as we are talking about users so i'll write here u plus this time i'll write here s instead of x give it a space write the file name hit enter let's ls minus l here and here if you see now we have our ws permission and we have capital s capital s mean this file is not executable to make this file executable we'll use the same command but instead of writing here plus s we'll write here plus x this plus x will make this file executable now if you see now we have our w small s permission for our file one so this is how you can make your file to have special permission with suid or special user identification now i'll talk to you about guid guid stands for group user identification let me clear that and i'll use the same file and i'll change its permission this time i'll write here g plus s hit enter let's ls hyphen l here so here if you see we have our ws permission it means whoever use this group or whoever the part of this group will have the special permission for this particular file regarding this group let me clear my screen here and let's talk about the last special permission and it is called as sticky bit well this sticky bit gets used for the other users or let's say when you try to put the file or a directory into the network and you want all the other users to access and use it but at the same time you want that particular file to be prohibited for the other user to delete it so that is why we use sticky bit if i ls space hyphen l here if you see we do not have any sticky bit on for other users for that purpose i'll write here chmod space this time i'll write here a plus t space name of the file which is file one hit enter let's ls space hyphen l here now if you see now we have sticky bit on for other users so it means all the other users will be able to use the file that i'll communicate or i'll share in the network but they won't be able to delete or change that particular file so this is how and this is why sticky bit is very important and this is how you can set it on and that was all about this video i'll see you in the next one in this video we'll talk about how to configure ntp service well first of all i'll use a command into my terminal and the command is sudo space lsd underscore release space hyphen cd here i have the information about the system that i am using at this moment after that before you install the ntp service make sure to update your system so i'll write here sudo apt update and i'll just hit enter we are done with the update and now we are ready to install our ntp service or you can say net tools 
So for that purpose, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a command. This is the command that you can follow. Basically, it will install all the essential net tools that we need for our NTP service. So I'll just hit enter now. This process or this particular step will take a little bit of time. So be patient and let it get complete. After we are done with this step, I'll move ahead and then I'll show you that how we can install the NTP service itself. At the moment, we are installing all the necessary tools that are essential for NTP. We are done here with the installation of all the essential net tools. Now, before we install the actual NTP service, we have to update our system one more time. So I'll write here sudo apt hyphen get update. Hit enter. Again, it will take your few seconds. So be patient and wait for it. Now it's time to install our NTP service. The command for that is sudo space apt hyphen get install space ntp space hyphen y hyphen y is in case if it asks you about any permission it will take yes as an answer by default just hit enter now so as you can see it has started the process so again it is not going to take a lot of time so be patient as we are done with this step now we'll check the version of our ntp I'll write here SNTP space hyphen hyphen version. I'll just hit enter. So here we have the version and we have some information about our NTP. Now I'll clear my terminal. And now what we need to do, we need to go into a conf file where we'll edit that file. So for that purpose, I'll write here sudo space nano space slash etc slash NTP dot con hit enter. So this is the file and if it's scroll down, here you can see we have four pools that we are going to use in order to have a communication with our client. Open your browser now and go to the support.ntp.org and from there we'll look for NTP pool servers. Scroll down and look for your region and then just click on your region and it will give you the pool or the servers that you will need in order to have the communication with your client. In my case, this is the pool. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to copy all of this. I'll right click on it. I'll copy this one. Now I'll minimize. So this is my configuration file. What I'm going to do now, I'm just going to comment all these lines that are there by default. After that, I'm going to paste all those that I had copied for my region. So here we are. Now let me rearrange all of these. We are good to go. Now I'll just press control X. Y and hit enter. And now we need to start our NTP service. So I'll write here sudo service space NTP start hit enter. After we are done with the start of our service, now let's check the status of our service. So I'll just write here status and it is active and running. Now I'll write here if config hit enter. This is the IP address that we are going to use in order to have communication with this machine and our client. After that here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write here host name because host name and the IP address are the two things that we are going to require in order to have the communication and in order to sync the time of all the clocks that are there into our network. So this is my host name, which is Zubair hyphen virtual hyphen machine. And here we have IP address. So we are done here with everything that was needed to be done into our Ubuntu. Now for the second machine or for my client, I'm going to use Linux Mint. You can have Ubuntu server, any other Linux distribution, any server, it's all up to you. So I'll head back to my Linux Mint now. So we are back into our Linux Mint. Here, first thing that we need to do is to update our system. So the command is sudo space apt hyphen get space update and hit enter. Give it your password and hit enter once again. After that, here we have to install NTP date service. So for that purpose, the command is sudo space apt hyphen get space install space NTP date space hyphen y and just hit enter. After this step, we have to go into one of the files to configure it. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to write here sudo space slash etc okay before etc we have to use text editor and i'm going to use nano so i'll write here nano space slash etc 
slash hosts. This is the file and here we have to enter the IP address of our Ubuntu and that was 192.168.111.128 So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to change it to 128 instead of 129 After we are done with this one, we also have to write the host name in here and the host name was zubair-virtual-machine So here I'll write 128 I'll just exit from it I'll press Y in order to save the changes After this step here I'll write sudo ntp date space right here your host name and that was zubair hyphen virtual hyphen machine in my case and now if I hit enter and here if you see we have successfully configured our ntp service and here as you can see it says adjust time server of this IP address and that means our service is up and running after you are done with this step, at the end of it, make sure to start your NTP service once again. And we are good to go and we are done with this video as well. I'll see you in the next video. In this video, I'll talk to you about secure communication and copying of files. And I'll do that with the help of SSH. And I'll show you that how you can do that on your Linux distributions and on your Windows operating system as well. So first of all what I'm gonna do, I'm going to write here I have config to find out my IP address. So my IP address is 192.168.111.128. Now I'll head to my Linux Mint and I'll show you that how I can copy the file from my Ubuntu to my Linux Mint. So this is my Linux Mint. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to create a connection using SSH. I'll write here SSH, username of my remote machine which is zubair at its ip address which is 192.168.111.128 hit enter now i have to enter the password of my machine in my case it is ubuntu so i'll enter the password of ubuntu hit enter here you can see it has welcomed us into the ubuntu now if i go to my desktop of my ubuntu if i ls here i do not have anything let's create a file in here i'll name this file as f1 hit enter if i ls here here we have f1 file let's head back to our ubuntu so here if you see here we have f1 file that we have created from our linux mint now i'll copy this file from here to linux mint for that purpose first of all i have to log out from this session i'll clear my screen and now i'll write here scp space name of my remote user which is zubat its IP address because this is the destination from where I'll be copying my file after that colon and now I'll give the path to my file and the path is home slash zubair slash desktop slash name of the file which was f1 after that give it a space and here we have to write the destination and the destination in my case will be home zubair desktop okay you might be confused here well this is the destination where i want my file to be copied and this is the address of this particular machine which is linux hint username is also zubair so what i'm trying to do here i'm trying to copy the file from the desktop location of my ubuntu and the name of file is f1 and i'm copying it to my desktop of my linux mint this is the IP address of my Ubuntu and this is the username now I'll hit enter and I'll give it password of my Ubuntu because I am copying my file from Ubuntu and here if you see here it says 100% and on our desktop here we have a file with the name of f1 so this is how you can do that from one Linux distribution to other now I'll show you that how you can do that on your Windows operating system so this is my Windows operating system and here I'll look for command prompt and I'll open that one as an administrator. First of all, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to see if I have a connection with my username onto my Ubuntu. Again, I'll use the same IP address that was 192.168.111.128. Hit enter. Give it the password. Hit enter once again. Yes, we do have a connection with our Ubuntu through SSH. Now let's go to the CD desktop and let's see what do we have there so we have f1 file over there and i want to copy this file to my windows operating system desktop so what i'm going to do here 
first of all i log out from this let me clear my terminal okay here i have to use cls so here i'll write scp space name of the user then the ip address which was 192.168.111.128 after that colon address to your file that you want to copy and that file is on to my desktop of my ubuntu file right here home slash zubair slash desktop and here i'll write the name of the file which was f1 after that give it a space and here we'll write a destination and in our case destination is windows desktop so for that purpose i'll write here c colon slash users slash zubair slash desktop and hit enter it is asking for the password and here you can see process has been done 100 percent and here we have a file onto our desktop that we have just copied from our ubuntu so how cool and how easy it is and obviously at the same time it is very secure as we are using ssh so this is how you can copy your files from one place to another and that brings us to the end of this video i'll see you in the next one in this video we'll check the current firewall configuration well in some of the linux distribution a firewall comes by default and in some of them we have to install one if i look for firewall into my linux distribution i do not have one well if you do not have the firewall there is no problem because linux itself is a secure operating system but still if you want to install it you can install one by following this command as sudo apt is install give it a space gufw give it a space hyphen y gufw is a firewall that comes with a user interface and it's very easy to understand very easy to use and very easy to configure we are done with the installation process now let's check if we have firewall available yes we do have a firewall available into our system i'll just open it i'll give it my password and now let's see the current or default configuration of our firewall that we have just installed basically we have three type of profiles with public it will have different status for your incoming and outgoing traffic let's go public and what it's gonna do it's gonna reject incoming traffic onto your network or onto your system but it will allow you to have your outgoing traffic if you go with home it will have a different configuration in terms of incoming and outgoing traffic for example in terms of home it has disabled my status or disabled my firewall and i cannot have any incoming traffic and i cannot have any outgoing traffic as well let's go with public and in case if you want to suggest or if you want to have your own personalized rule you can do so for example here we have rules reports and log let me increase the size of this particular gui and let's see what do we get so basically if you click on your rule you can define your own rules as well to do so just click on this plus button and it will open a window like this so here you can define the policy here either you can allow this deny this reject this or you can put a limit other than that you can have a direction it can be one way or it can be both way it's all up to you then we have the category and subcategory and at the end we have the application or you can say the services let me close this one for this time and here i want to show you that here we have a button that says status if you just click on this button it will disable or it will close your firewall entirely and no matter what type of rules you have set in your system or you have selected it will ignore all of them so let's go back to adding rules and here we have pre-configured simple advanced in simple we can define our own customized rules here we have policy we can have direction and we can also have the protocol i leave everything and here we have the advanced it is pretty similar to the simple one but here we have some advanced option along with it as well so let's go to pre-configured and here i'll show you an example as well if i go to my application and it will open a list for me here i have all the services that i can ignore i can block or i can restrict for example here if you see here we have a BitTorrent. if i just click on it and in terms of policy if i deny this one what it's gonna do it's gonna deny the traffic that is coming from BitTorrent. 
it means i'll not be able to use bittorrent onto my system as i have defined a rule onto my firewall in case if you are done with setting all the rules and all its option just click on this add button and we'll have a rule onto our linux distribution up and ready after that just click on close so here you can see we have different rules and all of them are for bittorrent in case if you want to delete particular one you can just click on this minus sign again select one and click on minus sign and in case if you want to delete more than one you can select more than one and click on this minus sign and it will remove all the rules now here we have an option that allows us to edit a selected rule let's say i want to edit this bittorrent rule but i don't want to delete it so in terms of policy i want to allow it for the time being now i'll be able to use bittorrent onto my system other than that i can have destination and source ip address here i have port number and in terms of direction i can have in or out so this is how you can edit and set your rules and this was all about the default configuration of a firewall and that's it for this video i'll see you in the next one in this video we'll talk about open port or services well for that purpose i'll use two of the linux distribution first one is ubuntu and the second one will be linux mint well there are several ways that you can follow in order to find out what ports or services are open onto your system currently first of all i'll use netstat command which is netstat space hyphen hyphen listen what it's gonna do it's gonna show you all the ports that are open or all the ports that are listening to your request or not hit enter so here if you see here i have tcp and udb ports and here tcp is listening and udp is not it means we have communication and we can use tcp for our further communication as you can see we have ssh http with tcp and with udp there is no listening along with netstat there are different flags that you can use for example in case if you want to see only those ports that are udp just write here VAUN and hit enter. Here it has shown me all the UDP ports that are there into my system, but none of them are listening. I'll use the same command, but at the end of it, I'll write here VATN. This command will return me the ports or services that are related to TCP and are listening. So here we have all those ports that are related to TCP and all of them are listening at the moment. So this is one of the way that you can follow. Other way is to use nmap command. nmap doesn't come pre installed in some of the Linux distribution. So I have installed it into my system. Other than that, I also have SSH and firewall. This is my Linux distribution. And here I also have nmap and SSH installed. Before that, I'll enable my UFW, which is Ubuntu firewall. So I'll write here sudo UFW space enable enter my firewall is active and enabled and now let's find out the current ip address of my linux mint the ip address is 192.168.111.132 so what i'm gonna do i'm going to check that what are the ports that are open and available into my linux mint from my ubuntu so what i'm gonna do here into my ubuntu i'm going to write here and map but before that here i have to write sudo and map give it a space here I'll write the IP address 192.168.111.132 hit enter. It will not show me any port that are open into my system because I haven't used any flag at this particular moment. But let me show you that how we can establish a connection. Here it says 11 second remaining. Just keep on hitting enter and it will show you the current status or it will also tell you about the current progress as you can see we are done with everything and here it says all the thousand scan ports on this particular ip address are filtered and all the process was done in this particular time now let's see and let's try to find out some particular ports what i'm going to do here i'm going to use the same command but this time i'll use a flag along with it that is hyphen p and i'll write here 1 to 200 hit enter what it's going to do it's going to check 200 ports and then it will tell us if there are any ports open onto this particular system which is linux mint at the moment we do not have any status why is that so well because we have 
firewall enabled into our Linux Mint. So we have to disable it first. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to disable my firewall. So I'll write here sudo ufw disable and hit enter. So we have successfully disabled our firewall. Now if I use the same command, here you can see we have a port number that is 22. It is open for SSH. Then for our HTTP, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, we have a port number that is 80 and it is up and running. In case if you want to change the particular number for the search of your ports, you can do so. Let's do that for 1 to 100 and let's see what do we get. So here we have the same ports that are open and they are ready to be used for SSH and HTTP. And here it says not shown 98 because all these 98 ports are closed into your system. And basically my system means Linux Mint. So these were some of the ways that you can follow in order to find out the open ports into your Linux distribution or onto your servers. And that's it for this video. In this video, we'll talk about firewall supported services. Well, firewall as a service is a solution that is based on the cloud firewall and it delivers the advanced layer or seventh generation firewall capabilities. It includes different access controls such as advanced threat prevention, URL filtering, intrusion prevention system, and DNS security as well. Firewall services also defines the type of traffic to which a particular file rule applies. And network services like web browsing, file sharing, and remote access to different services, different servers, different machines are example of these firewall services. And a particular service use a certain protocol and a port number. For example, in case of HTTP service, it uses the TCP protocol and in terms of its port number, it uses the port number 80. And a firewall service uses two kinds of ports, initiator port and responder port. And as the name suggests, initiator port initiates the connection or communication or the process and responder ports response. And no matter if the computer is an initiator port or responder port, it depends on the direction of the traffic. And now I'll show you that how you can look for the network services into your Linux distribution. Well, to allow any service, you have to configure the firewall into your Linux distribution. Otherwise, you cannot use that particular service. So I'll show you two ways. First one will be from the CMD and the second one will through a GUI application. So first of all, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write a command as firewall hyphen CMD, give it a space and write here hyphen hyphen permanent, give it a space hyphen hyphen list hyphen all hyphen zones. Basically, now I'm trying to find out all the zones that are there into my Linux distribution. After giving your password, hit enter. So these are all the zones that are there into my firewall. And here, as you can see, we have home, external, DMZ, drop. And under each zone, we have different services. For example, here it says services SSH. Here we do not have any one of them. Then down here, we do not have any here as well. And in some of them, you will see SSH present. Now, let's say if I want to change the default zone or I want to check out what is my default zone. So for that purpose, I'll write here firewall hyphen CMD, give it a space hyphen hyphen get hyphen default again hyphen and write here zone. And if you hit enter now, it will give you your default zone in terms of your firewall. It is public at the moment. Now, in case if you want to change it, instead of writing here get right here set after that at the end of this command right here equal and write the zone that you want for your firewall i'll write here work hit enter give it your password hit enter here it says success so this was one of the way that we can follow now at the end of it we have to reload our firewall so for that purpose i'll write here firewall hyphen cmd space hyphen hyphen reload and hit enter give it your password hit enter once again and we are good to go let me clear my screen and here if you see the default zone is now work so this was a brief introduction about your firewall and its services but this is a bit of hectic and not easy for every user to use it through the firewall 
we have another way that we can follow and that is we have a GUI application and we can install it very easily and the name of the tool or a utility is firewall hyphen config after that just hit enter it will open an application in your system just like this one give it your password hit enter and we are good to go so here if you see here we have different zones just like earlier we had work home external drop tmz block etc and in terms of each zone we have different services in here you will notice that we'll have dhcp version 6 client enabled and in case if you want to enable some other service just click on that one and from here in terms of the configuration make it permanent and you will be able to use that particular service other than that you can also configure the port number in here and here we have different protocols that we can define or we can add a new one then we have source port just keep clicking on this arrow sign and it will show you more and more option so here in terms of port forwarding you can make any your port go forward and let's say you want to block a particular port number for that purpose you can also block a particular one by writing here the port number and then you can block it and you can make it work as per your liking so these are different services that are there in terms of the firewall into our system and this is the application that you can download and install in terms of configuring it so this was all about the checking the services that are related to our firewall and that's it for this video i'll see you in the next one in this video i'll talk to you about what is hyphen hyphen permanent well the permanent configuration is stored in configuration files and gets loaded and becomes the new runtime configuration whenever a machine gets boot up or any service gets reload or restarted well in firewall configuration permanent is a phenomena or you can say it's a style of configuring your services that makes your services to run whenever you want let's say i want to add a particular port number into firewall configuration to ensure that port number remains there we have to make it permanent and just like that we have different other network configuration network rules that we modify or configure at the end of it we have to make them permanent so that they can take place it is just like we ensure something or we make something permanent in our system so i'll show you two ways that you can follow in order to make anything permanent into your system first one will be through the user interface or an application that we used in the previous video as well and that was firewall hyphen config just hit enter and it will open a window in front of you like this give it your password hit enter once again so here if you see as i mentioned in the previous video that here we have different zone and here i have different services now let's say i want to add one of the service into my network or into my firewall configuration let's talk about bitcoin so i just need to click on this one and here it says configuration at this moment it is runtime what i can do i can make it permanent so as i have made it permanent whenever my machine will boot up or any service will reload or restart this service will be there as permanent service in the system and it will work every time so this is how you can make any service any port any protocol or any your port forwarding permanent into your firewall configuration this was through the user interface or with the use of an application now i'll show you a way that you can follow from your command line as well so first of all let me clear my terminal and if you remember i told you in the previous video that how we can find out about the default zone how we can change the zone and different other things now i'll show you that how we can add a port number into our network firewall configuration and how we can make sure that it stays there permanently this is the command sudo firewall hyphen cmd and just like the previous command this time we'll use hyphen hyphen zone that will be public you can make your zone work or any other zone as well after that here i'm adding a port that is 7199 you can add any port number as per your liking after that it is a tcp it means it will follow the tcp protocol and at the end of it i'm making it permanent by using hyphen hyphen permanent if i hit enter it says success it means we have successfully added this port number into our firewall configuration so this is how permanent works and this is the purpose 
of using permanent with our firewall configuration and that's it for this video i'll see you in the next one in this video we'll talk about managing partition well before i discuss about the partitions what are their types and how we can create them well first of all open the settings of your virtual machine and then click on this add button from here select the hard disk and click on next select the type i'll go with the scsi and it is the recommended one as well click on next and here we have an option that says create a new virtual disk just click on next and from here you can select the size that you want to provide to your virtual disk i'll just go with 10 and click on next from here just click on finish and click on ok and you are good to go now i'll talk to you about how we can manage partitions well in linux distributions we can only make four primary partitions and in case if you want to make more than four partition we have to make one of them as an extended partition and in that extended partition we can make as many number of partitions as per our liking for example that partition will be called as logical partitions we cannot install any operating system in the logical partitions but we can do that in primary partition at any time well the benefit of having partition is that we can install multiple operating system at the same time in single disk now i'll talk to you about and i'll show you that how we can make multiple partitions into our linux distribution first of all i'll use the command as lsdlk which is ls block hit enter this is the partition of my system which is of 40 gigabytes and this is the one that i added into my system and i just showed you as well well sdb1 is the one that have been created as 2 gigabyte and i have already created this one now i'll show you that how you can create your own primary partition in the partition that you have just added or in the hard disk that you have just added from the settings of your virtual machine so the command for that is fdisk space slash dev slash sdb hit enter here you can see it says permission denied now what we need to do we need to sudo this command and here it says command for help I'll just press N because I want to create a new partition. Hit enter. After that, it will ask you what type of partition do you want to create. I want to create primary partition. So I'll enter P, hit enter. And here it is asking us about the number that we want to give to our partition. Well, one has already been assigned. If you see above, here it is. So we can assign two, three or four. Default one is two. So I'll go with two, hit enter. And after that, here we have to provide the sector. I'll go with 2048, which is the default one. Okay, here I have to write 2048. And now if I hit enter, okay, we do not have to specify the range in here. We just need to hit enter. After that, right here, plus 2 gigabytes, because I want to make the partition of 2 gigabytes. So right here, plus 2G and hit enter. And we are done with creating our partition and what we can do here either we can just get out of this or we can keep on making new partitions i'll create a new partition in here again so for that purpose i'll write here n hit enter and here it is asking what type of partition do you want well i want primary so i'll hit enter partition number well one and two has already been assigned so either we can go for three or four i'll go with three hit enter and first sector just hit the enter it will take the value by default now again i want to have plus 2 gigabytes so i'll write here plus 2 g and here i'll hit enter so we are done with the third one so for the fourth one i'll again enter n hit enter so now again pre for primary then hit enter then again for 2 gigabytes so i'll write here plus 2 g hit enter and we are good to go so as we are done with all the four partition now let's see if we can make the fifth one so for that purpose i'll again press n and hit enter here it says to create more partition first replace a primary with an extended partition this is the same thing that i was discussing with you earlier that we can only make four primary partition to make the changes permanent for the partitions that we have created i'll press w hit enter and here i'll run a command as part probe what this command will do this command will make sure that our kernel read the changes that we have just made into our system. 
now let's clear our screen and again i'll write here ls blk or ls block hit enter so here if you see in our sdb we have created four of the partitions and all of them are two gigabyte now let's create an extended partition into our linux distribution so for that purpose again i'll write here f disk space slash dev slash sdb which is the name of my partition hit enter okay i have to use sudo along with it so i'll write here sudo hit enter now here it is asking what do you want to do well first of all i want to delete the partition and here it is asking that what partition number do you want to delete well i'll delete the first one so i'll press one hit enter and it says partition one has been deleted now i'll write here n hit enter and this time i'll go for extended partition press e hit enter for the default sector either you can go for 2048 or you can just hit enter and it will take the value on its own by default now here how much size do you want to give to your extended partition either you can decide one or you can just hit enter it will take the size on its own it says created a new partition one of type extended and it has the size of two gigabytes after that to make the changes permanent press w hit enter and again i'll write here part prop hit enter we are good to go let's clear our terminal and let's write here ls blk and hit enter so here we have created one extended partition into our linux distribution so here i'll write sudo space f disk space slash dev slash sdb hit enter and here i want to create a new partition it says all primary partition are in use add a logical partition 5 because if you remember we made four primary and one extended one and because of extended one now we can create more partition without any problem but this new partition will be the logical one as it says so here it says define the first sector just hit enter and it will take the default value again hit enter it will take the default value again on its own to so write the changes press w hit enter and at the end i'll write here part probe so that my kernel can understand the changes clear our terminal let's write here ls log hit enter so here if you see now in our sdb drive or in sdb partition now we have five partition three of them are primary and one of them is extended and one of them in the extended one is the logical one so this is how you can make your partition this is how you can manage your partition and this is how you can make a certain partition as a logical one after making it extended one so i hope now that now you have an idea that how you can work with your partition and that's it for this video i'll see you in the next one in this video we'll talk about making the file systems well first of all i'll use a command as ls blk or ls block here if you see here i have one partition ssda and in that i have three of them then i have another partition which is sdb i'll make a new partition in sda partition so for that purpose i'll write here sudo space f disk space slash dev slash name of the partition which is sda in my case hit enter so here as i want to create a new partition for that purpose i'll write here and hit enter again and here i have to give the partition number i'll give four hit enter here it is asking about the sector just hit enter leave everything as it is either you can give the value for the sector or for the space you want to give to your partition or you can hit enter and here it has created a new partition with name 4 and this is the size now to make the changes permanent press w and hit enter and we are out of it now if i write here ls blk hit enter here if you see we have a new partition as sda4 and it has this size which is around 1007 kilobyte now what we need to do we need to make the file system this time the command for that is sudo but before that i'll write here mkfs dot ext just press your tab key and it will show you the available options either you can go for ext2 format ext3 ext4 and just like that so what i'm going to do here i'm going to use ext2 format but before that here i'll write sudo space mkfs dot ext2 space 
now here i have to give the path of the partition that i want to make this particular file system so i'll write here sda4 because sda4 was the partition that we have just created now i'll just hit enter press y hit enter and here we have a message as done it means we are done with creating the file system now i'll look for a disk into my system here it is and this is my primary partition with 43 gigabyte of space here if you see here we have a file system partition 4 and it has almost 1 megabyte of size and it has the file system as ext2 and if you remember we just created this one with ext2 file system now what i'm going to do i'm going to delete this file system or this partition that we have just created and i'll create a new one so for that purpose first of all i'll write here sudo space f this space slash dev slash sda hit enter to delete a partition press d select the partition in my case it was 4 hit enter now let's create a new one for that press n give it 4 let's hit enter once again leave everything as it is and again i'll hit enter one more time here i'll press l because i want to have some other options in terms of file system so these are different file systems that you can go for and you can choose one i'll leave everything as it is i'll not select any one of these because i want to do something else so i just press ctrl z i'll again go to ftisk here i'll create new one and here it says default and i'm going to create the fifth one so hit enter again hit enter and again hit enter so again we have the same size for our the partition with number five now i'll press w to make these changes permanent so i'll hit enter once again and now if i write here lsblk this time we'll have five partition into our sda1 now what i'm going to do i'm going to make my sda5 have a new file system and this time i'll use vfat so for that purpose let me clear my terminal this time i'll write here sudo space mkfs and here i'll write dot vfat space now here give the path of your partition and my partition is sda5 hit enter so we have successfully created a file system for our partition 5 that has the type as vfat or fat so here if you see here i have partition 1 partition 2 partition 3 partition 4 and this is my partition 5 and the type of file system for my partition 5 is fat so it means we have successfully created a file system for our partition as per our liking. So this is how you can make your file system in your Linux distributions. And that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we'll talk about how to mount and unmount TIFS and NFS network file system. So first of all, I'm going to show you that how we can configure NFS file system. But before that, we have to install nfs its packages and some of its utils so open your terminal and write the commands that i'm going to write in that right here sudo space apt space install space nfs hyphen kernel hyphen server and hit enter we are done with this one after this step we have to create a directory in which we'll have our nfs share so what i'm going to do i'm going to write here sudo mkdir space hyphen p space slash mnt slash nfs hyphen share hit enter after this step we have to give all the permissions so that everyone in the network can access this share directory so for that i'll write here sudo ch on space hyphen capital r nobody colon no group it means there is no restriction give it a space and then have the path to your directory which was mnt slash nfs hyphen share after that hit enter now as we are done with assigning all the permissions after this step we can also tweak the file permission as per our preferences for example I can give the privileges of all the content inside the directory. So for that, I'll write here sudo ch own triple seven. It means all the permission for all type of user. 
so it's all up to you if you want to go with that one or not i'll just remove this command and now i'll show you that how we can mount and unmount nfs and network file system well first of all we have to enable and we have to start the system ctl service of our nfs client so for that i'll write here system ctl space enable space nfs hyphen client and after that right here dot target give it a space and i'm going to use another command in here and that is system ctl space start space nfs hyphen client dot target okay we have to use this command with sudo so i'll write sudo at the start of it and now i'll hit enter i'll give my password hit enter once again we are done with this step as well and now we need to edit a particular file and in that we'll add a configuration line so for that i'll write here sudo space nano space slash etc slash fs tab hit enter it will open a file like this in that file make sure to enter this line that says nfs server colon slash home slash tools space slash mnt nfs4 defaults 00 after that i'll just get out of my terminal and i'll move ahead after this step we have to execute this file so the command for that is mount space hyphen a okay write sudo at start of it hit enter and we are done with this step as well in case if you want to unmount your nfs what you need to do you need to go back into the file that was this one and just hit enter and remove this particular line and after you are done removing this line let me remove it so that i can show you and i'll show you how to unmount it so i'll just press ctrl x save the changes hit enter here i'll write sudo space u mount space slash mnt it will unmount the whole directory of our nfs hit enter and here it says not mounted so this is how you can mount and unmount your nfs now i'll show you that how we can do the same for our cifs first of all let me clear my terminal and this time first of all i'll show you that how we can install cifs util the command for that is sudo apt space install space hyphen y space cifs hyphen utils and hit enter okay we have to write here cifs not sifs hit enter and we are done here as well after we are done with this step now we are ready to configure it and we are ready to configure the file that is really needed and for that purpose i'll go to the directory as sudo space nano space slash etc slash fs tab and hit enter so here we are and here we have to add a line and that line will allow us to mount our directory for our cifs network so what i'm going to do i'm going to just paste the line you can follow that line from my screen and here it is save the changes so for that press ctrl x press y hit enter and now we are ready to mount this file commands is again like mount space hyphen a sudo at start of it and we are good to go now again just like the nfs in case if you want to unmount this just go back to the file that we edited earlier this was the file hit enter remove this line save this file hit enter and here just write sudo space u mount space slash mnt and hit enter and we are good to go and this is how you can mount and unmount nfs and cifs network file system and that also brings me to the end of this video i'll see you in the next one in this video we are going to talk about handling these web files and partitions well we have talked a lot about the partitions that how we can create them how we can delete them and in case if i want to create an extended partition how we can do that i'll repeat that here in this video as well but first of all i'll talk to you about web files how we can create them and what is the structure of working with them well basically web files are just like your ram memory and it helps you a lot with your RAM memory. So the method to create your swap file is very easy into your system. Just use the commands that I'm going to use into my terminal and you are good to go. So first of all, right here, sudo space dd. 
this is the command dd is itself the command that will help you to create your swap files give it a space right here if if stands for input file equals slash dev slash zero i mean this is the directory from where we are going to give the input give it a space of of stands for output file means where we are going to write the changes so i'll write here swap files Basically, swap file comes or stays under the root directory and as slash is the root, after that we have the swap file, give it a space, we'll write here ps, it means size, I'll give it 1 megabyte of size, after that give it a space and write here count, count stands for or count means how many count of 1 megabyte, if I write here 1024, it means I'm going to create a swap file of 1 gigabyte because as we know in 1 gigabyte we have 1024 megabyte so as the size is 1 megabyte and if you multiply it with count which is 1024 it will be 1 gigabyte I'm just going to create a swap file of 20 megabyte give it a space and here write status equal progress and just hit enter and here it says 20 plus records in, 20 plus records out means we have successfully created our swap file. But at the moment, it is not the swap file actually. Before we move ahead, here we have to give the permissions or here we have to give the 600 expression to our swap file. Because if you do not do it right now, you will see an error in future while working with your swap file. So I'll just write here chmod 600 space slash swap file hit enter we are done with giving the permissions and now what we need to do we need to make our swap file a swap file so the command for that is sudo space mk swap give it a space again and write here the directory which was swap file if you remember just hit enter and you are good to go here it says setting up swap space version one size is 20 megabyte and there we have different other information and here we have the uuid that we have with every partition that we create into our system now what we need to do we need to go to our fs tab and there we need to configure a particular file so let me clear my terminal first so i'll write here sudo space my text editor i'm going to use nano you can use anyone as per your liking after that, I'll give the path to my fs tab. Hit enter. So this is the file. And make sure here you have the information like swap file. Then under the installation, make sure it's none. And then under the file system or dump, it is swap. Because if you remember, we have different file system like ext4, ext2, nfs and different other thing. Make sure with term, make sure that in terms of swap file, it is swap then under the pass it is default and then you are good to go so i'll just get out of this to do so i'll just press ctrl x press y hit enter and now i'm ready to move ahead now in case if you want to remove your swap file that you have just created you have to write sudo space rm space slash path to your swap file folder which is this one hit enter and we are good to go and we have successfully removed our swap file and this is how you can create and this is how you can manage your swap files you can have your own personalized space or you can allocate your own personalized space for your swap file so that was all about it and now i'll talk to you about that how we can work with partitions well if i write here lsblk hit enter here i have one primary partition and in one primary partition i have three partitions or basically this is the main partition of my system and in that I have three of my primary partition as SDA1, SDA2, SDA3. Down here I have another partition and this one is the virtual one. I'll not talk about it and I'll not work on that. I'll show you that how you can work with the primary one. Now in case if you want to create a partition just write here fdisk give it a space right here slash dev slash name of the partition. I'm going to work with SD1, so I'll write here SD1, hit enter. Okay, here I have to use sudo, so I'll write here sudo, hit enter. Now, what I want to do, I want to create a partition. So, as I'm going to create new, so for that I'll write here n, hit enter, 
here it says partition number well 123 has already been assigned if you see here here it says sda1 sda2 sda3 so either you can use 4 or any number between 4 to 128 i'll go with 4 hit enter now the new partition will have sda4 name after that just hit enter if you do not know first sector here it says last sector just hit enter and leave everything as it is and here it says a new partition created for of type linux file system and size is 1007 kilobytes now to write the changes or to make sure that your partition stays there press w hit enter and now if i write here lsblk hit enter here you can see we have a new partition as sda4 under the sda section now i'll show you that how you can delete one partition i'll again go to my sda directory or sda partition this time as i'm going to delete a partition so i'll press d and hit enter here it is asking that which partition do you want to delete well this is the one that we have just created or i can delete any one of these as well so i'll press 4 and hit enter and it says partition 4 has been deleted to make the changes permanent press w hit enter and we are good to go so this is how you can manage your swap files and partitions into your linux distribution and that's it for this video in this video we are going to talk about nfs client and nfs server well for nfs server i'll use my ubuntu and for nfs client i'll use my linux mint this is my linux mint and with the help of that i'll access my server so first of all i'll write here ssh username which is zubair at my ubuntu and the ip address of my ubuntu which is 192.168.111.12 dot one two nine and hit enter give it password and hit enter once again so we have successfully created our connection with our ubuntu machine now what we need to do we need to install and in configure some of the things into our ubuntu server or our ubuntu machine so first of all we need to install nfs kernel server and nfs common into our ubuntu we use this command that says sudo apt install nfs kernel server nfs common rpc bind hit enter give it the password and we are good to go now we need to create a directory so i'll write here sudo space mkdir space slash war slash nfs in that folder i'll create one more directory and that will be public hit enter and now i'll assign permission for this particular directory so i'm going to use chmod this time chmod space triple seven you can decide or you can assign the permissions as per your liking but i want everything to be assigned and everything to be accessed so that is why i'm going with 777 777 mean read write execution permission for honor group and all the other users and now we need to edit a file and the name of the file is slash etc slash fs tab first of all i'll write here sudo space nano which is a text editor you can use any text editor as per your liking after that i'll write here fs tab hit enter and in this particular line we have to add a line that will configure our file let me remove this particular line and then i'll move ahead and i'll show you what do we need to add in here so basically in this particular line we have to write the path of the folder or the directory that we have created and after that we have to write some of the permissions like rewrite no synchronization and subtree check and along with that also make sure to add your ip address so the ip address of my ubuntu is 192.168.111.128.129 so this is how and this is what we need to do in this file just press ctrl x and get out of this okay before i get out of this there is one thing that i want to discuss and that is if you do not mention the IP address in here, in that case, anyone who can access this particular IP address or this particular server can mount this, but I can restrict it. So I'll enter the IP address of the person or, or the people to whom I want to give access. I want to give access to only one client and that will be my Linux Mint machine. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write the IP address of my Linux Mint, which is 132 now i'll just get out of this i'll press y hit enter and we are good to go and now i need to configure my firewall and i want my firewall 
to allow NFS. So I'll write here sudo uFW allow NFS, hit enter. Here it says rules updated and it means we are good to go. To make the changes permanent that we have done from our Linux Mint into our Ubuntu, we have to reboot our connection. So I'll write here reboot, hit enter and it says permission denied. Okay, I'll use sudo and the collection has been closed. And now what we can do, we can reconnect to our Ubuntu machine. Let's create the connection once again. So I'll write here SSH Zubair at the rate of IP address which is 192.168.111.129 hit enter give it the password hit enter once again and we are good to go and now we can find out if the NFS server or the configuration that we have just done is working or not so I'll write here show mount hyphen e hit enter so here it says Zupair virtual machine and this is the address and that shows that it is working now just get out of this so i'll clear my terminal here and now we need to log out of this and i'll use my system as a linux mint user okay here we have to write log out hit enter and the connection has been closed now i'll be using my system as the linux mint user first of all here we need to create a directory so i'll write here mkdir slash mnt slash you can name your directory anything i'll name it as public one hit enter we are done with this step and here we have to assign the permission to our directory that we have just created so i'll write here chmod space triple seven slash mnt slash nfs dash public one hit enter and here we have to install nfs common this time the command for that is sudo apt install space rpc bind space nfs dash common and just hit enter and now we need to mount the directory that we created into our ubuntu server command for that is sudo mount space 192.168.111.129 basically this is the ip address of my ubuntu slash war slash nfs slash public after that give it a space slash mnt well this is the path of the directory that we created into our linux mint slash mnt slash nfs dash public one hit enter so here we are good to go okay this mount will not stay there permanently for that purpose in case if you want to make it permanent I'll use a command as sudo space nano space slash etc slash fs tab hit enter. In this file we'll add a line. First of all I'll write the IP address of my server which is 192.168.111.129 colon path to the folder or directory which was war slash nfs slash public give it a space slash mnt slash nfs dash public one give it a space again right here nfs space rw means rewrite space zero space zero press ctrl x press y hit enter now in order to see if the connection has been established or not and to see if it is working or not i'll open my files explorer and this time i'll go to my file system here we have our mnt folder here we have our nfs public and nfs public one i'll open my nfs public one and here i'll create a new file so i'll right click here new document empty document i'll name this document as zubair hit enter you can add anything into this one i'll add i hope you liked watching this video after that i'll save this file after that now if i go to my terminal again and here i'll have a connection with my server which was Zubair at the rate of 192.168.111.129 enter I'll give it my password now I'll go to cd slash war slash nfs slash public hit enter here you can see we have a file with the name of Zubair let's open this file and let's see what do we get so here we have a message as I hope you liked watching this video 
here we have a spelling mistake but that is not a problem in here but the thing is our client server connection has been established with the help of nfs and it is working pretty fine and we have no problem and that also brings me to the end of this video i'll see you in the next one in this video we are going to talk about sc linux security concept well security enhanced linux or sc linux is an architecture for linux system that allows the administrators to have more and more sophisticated control over who can access the system basically it's a security phenomena originally it was developed by the united states national security agency or nsa as a series of security patches for the linux kernel with the use of linux security modules called as lsm as well in sc linux or security enhanced linux it also defines the access control for the processes and for our application and files on the system with the use of security policies that composed of a set of rules that dictates the sa linux about what can and who can and can't be accessed and to enforce the access allowed by the policy well when a certain application or process that is known as subject makes a request to use or access an object or resource like a file SC Linux first checks if the subject is allowed that resource with an access vector cache where permissions are cached for subjects and objects. If it is not, the subject is not allowed the permission or access. And if SC Linux is not able to make a decision whether to grant the permission or not based on the cached permission in AVC or access vector cache, it sends the request to the security server and then the security server checks if the security context of the subject and object matches and then it checks the context of the app or process and the file security context gets applied from the sc linux policy database and permission is then granted or gets denied if the permission gets denied a message gets printed as denied and in SC Linux or Security Enhanced Linux, it is very essential and important part of the Linux security kernel and it acts as a protective agent on server. In the Linux kernel, SC Linux relies on mandatory access control which is also known as MAC. We also have a phenomena as DAC that is also known as discretionary access control. But SC Linux relies on MAC more. Linux permits and allows the server admin to define different type of permission for all the processes that are available in the system. It also defines that how all the processes can interact with other parts of the server such as pipes, files, sockets, directories, other processes, network ports, etc. And SA Linux or Security Enhanced Linux puts the restrictions on each of the above object as per the policy. For example, if a user who is an Apache user with full permission can only access war slash www slash html directory but he or she is not allowed to touch other part of the system such as if he or she want to go into the etc directory without policy modification. So this was a brief introduction about SA Linux security concepts, what it is, how it works and what are the benefits of it. And that's it for this video, I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we are going to talk about SE Linux mods. Well, SE Linux can run in three different operation modes. First one is disabled, then come permissive, last one is enforcing. In disabled mode, SE Linux is switched off. And in practice, this means that none of the Linux objects are labeled. And at the same time, they do not have a security context and consequently, this type is not being used for a lot of purposes and most of the time people avoid this. In permissive type, all the objects gets labeled and policy type is being used. And it only monitors and writes the SA Linux breaches to log files rather than deny access or any object interacting with another object. In an enforcing mode, this does all the same that we do in the permissive mode and it also actively deny the access when there is a breach. So I'll show you that what is the current 
state or the current mode of my Linux at this moment. I'm using Linux Mint to check the status, use the command SC status, hit enter. At the moment, the SC Linux status is disabled. Well, first of all, in case if you want to change the mod, what you need to do, you need to configure a file. So for that purpose, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write here sudo space nano. You can use any other text editor as per your liking. Go to your etc folder, then sc linux folder, then go to your config. After that, hit enter. Here, if you see here in sc linux, we have a disabled option. Just change this file and change this value to permissive. After that, press Ctrl X, press Y to save the changes and we are good to go. Means we have successfully changed the mode of our Linux. Let me clear my terminal. After you are done editing your file, make sure to reboot your system so that the changes can take place. Now I'll show you that how you can change the mode to your enforcing mode. But there are some prerequisite. For example, there are packages that are named as SA Linux policy targeted. LIB SE Linux Utils and then we have Policy Core Utils. So make sure you have these packages installed into your system and then only you will be able to change to enforcing mode. Now again we'll edit the same file and this time again I'll write sudo space nano space slash etc slash SA Linux slash config. After that hit enter and where you have permissive written change it to enforcing. And what it will do, it will change the mod of your SA Linux. So I'll write here, enforcing. After that, I'll press Ctrl X, I'll press Y, hit enter. And now in order to make these changes permanent into my system, I have to reboot it. And then this mod will be applied onto my whole system. And that was all about this video. So I'll see you in the next part. In this video, we are going to talk about SC Linux contacts. Well, just like mods, we also have some contacts in SC Linux. It's all about the file system, directories, devices, and processors that all of them have some associated security contacts. For files in our SC Linux, SC Linux stores a context label in the extended attributes of the file system and it contains additional information about the system object. And these are SC Linux user, their role, their type, and the security level associated with them. SC Linux uses this context information for the control of access by the processes, Linux users, and the files. Now I'll talk about SC Linux users, role, type, and level, or basically I'll talk about the object well, SC Linux maps every Linux user for the SC Linux user identity and then it gets used in the SC Linux context for the processes in a user session that a user uses. If we talk about the role, well, in the role based access control that is also called as RBAC, a role acts as the intermediary abstraction layer between the process domains or the file types and the SC Linux user. So basically, role and user are directly linked with each other. Now let's talk about the type. Well, a type defines the SC Linux file type or SC Linux process domain. And different processes get separated from each other as they run in their own domain. And this separation is very helpful as it prevents the processes from accessing and getting the files that other processes use. And that makes shows the integrity in the system. At the end, let's talk about the level. Well, a level is an attribute or you can say a level is a property of multi-level security. It is also called an MLS and we also have a phenomena as MCS that is called as multi-category security. In MLS, it is a pair of sensitivity level where low level, high level are there. And each level has an optional set of security categories to which it applies. And we can also define different security level for different user in the system. So this was a brief introduction about SC Linux context. And now I hope now that now you have an idea what SC Linux context is and why it gets used. And that's it for this video. Hello everyone. In this video, we'll talk about the Firewall D overview. Well, Firewall D is a demon as you can suggest by the name of it. And it's a firewall management solution for many Linux distribution. 
for example debian ubuntu fedora centos etc and it acts as an application interface for the ib tables filtering system that is offered and provided by the linux kernel it is protocol independent which means it supports both ipv4 and ipv6 ethernet bridges and along with that it also supports ip sets firewall d uses the concept of zones and services instead of ib tables and it also does not support or it also does not work on the concept of ip table chain and rules zones are a predefined set of rules that specify that what type of traffic will be allowed onto your system depending on the level of trust users have in a network in which their systems are connected and with the help of zone we can dictate a behavior that the firewall should allow the firewall d is managed by using the firewall hyphen cmd command line tool and it also provides an interface to manage runtime and permanent configuration there are nine predefined zones in the firewall d depending on the level of trust in ascending order it starts with drop then we have block public external internal dmz work home and trusted so this was a brief overview of firewall d now i'll show you that how it looks like and how we can work with it well i'll show you from the terminal along with that i'll also show it to you from its user interface application so first of all what i'm going to do here i'm going to open my terminal which is right here and here i'll write firewall hyphen config hit enter it will open an application for me just like this one i'll enter my password hit enter so here if you see as i mentioned earlier here we have nine zones that we get with firewall d and each zone have different services and different ports and different other things and on the top we have services then we have ip sets that each zone have so this is how it looks like and from here we can define different things and we can add different services in each zone in case if you want to change your zone you can do that now i'll show you that how you can work with your firewall d from your terminal or command line first of all i'll write here firewall hyphen cmd space hyphen hyphen get hyphen default hyphen zone this command will return me the current zone that i have selected or i'm using at this moment okay now in case if you want to change your zone for that purpose command is firewall hyphen cmd space hyphen hyphen set hyphen default hyphen zone equal and here write the name of the zone that you want to go with i'll go with work hit enter give it your password hit enter once again here it says success it means we have successfully changed our zone now in order to confirm it what you need to do use the same command but instead of writing here set just write here get hyphen default hyphen zone hit enter so here we have work as a zone that have been selected successfully so this was a brief overview of our firewall d into our linux distribution in the next video i'll talk to you about some other concepts related to firewall d so i'll see you in the next one in this video i'll talk about the features of firewall d and comparison of it with ip tables well if i talk about different features of the firewall d well one of the prominent is the ability and option of selection of zones as per our need and requirements not only that i can also include and exclude different services in it as well for example as you can see i have different zones available i can select any one of them from here and after that i can select a particular service that i want to include in this one for example here we have dhcp version 6 client i can also include the version 6 simple one then we have docker registry then we have dns over tls and not only that we have a huge list of services that we can include and exclude other than that we can also include some of the ports and we can exclude them for example let's say i want to include port number 8080 so what i need to do i just need to write here 8080 and i'm good to go i'll show it to you that how you can do that from your terminal as well other than that we have different protocols that we can define and we can add them into our firewall d then we have source ports and if you keep going forward it will show you more and more features one of the prominent one is port forwarding 
Let's say you want to forward your traffic from port 80 to port 8080. You can do so simply. Just click on this add button and from here you are good to go. I'll just close this one and now I'll show you that how you can include some of the services and some of the port numbers into your firewall D through your terminal. Well, first of all, I'll write here firewall hyphen CMD space hyphen hyphen zone equal in my case it is work space hyphen add hyphen service equals HTTP. So basically I'm trying to add HTTP service into my firewall D hit enter. Here it says unrecognized. Okay, here we have to use hyphen hyphen add. Enter, give it your password, hit enter once again. And here it says success. So this is how we can add a service into our firewall D. Not only that, we can also allow and deny a certain port number into our system to firewall D configuration. And post forwarding is the process that redirects the request from IP or port combination and redirect it to different IP or port. This is a technique that allows the remote machines to connect to a specific service in a private network. So before you configure your forwarding or port forwarding, you need to activate a service in your desired zone. And the command for that is firewall hyphen CMD space hyphen hyphen zone equal my zone is work. Give it a space hyphen hyphen add hyphen masquerade which is the name of service. After that, hit enter and here give it your password and we are good to go. Now, after this step, here to forward our traffic from my port number 80 or port 8080 to the same server, we have to run a command that I'm going to write into my terminal. And the command is firewall hyphen CMD space hyphen hyphen permanent space hyphen hyphen zone, which is work. Again, give it a space right here, hyphen, hyphen, add, hyphen, forward, hyphen, port, and that will be port 80. After that, right here, colon, proto, which stands for protocol, equals TCP, colon, to port, I mean from where to where, equals 8080. After that, hit enter. Give it your password hit enter once again again give it your password and we are good to go so these are some of the features of firewall d now at the end what i'm going to do i'm going to compare it with ip table well i'll talk to you about in terms of different features first of all if i talk about the affecting the changes that we made to the configuration well in firewall d it happens immediately on runtime but in IP tables, it requires rebooting the system to affect the changes. For example, let's say you have changed or you have added some of the rules in your firewall D. You do not have to reboot your system. It will happen immediately. But in terms of IP tables, you have to reboot the system so that the rules that you have added into your system can take place permanently. Then in firewall D, we get graphical user interface. But in IP tables, there is command line interface. Both of them are free and the parent project of both of them are Linux. Now I'll talk about some other features. If I talk about the system configuration, well, IP table and firewall D, they both use different configuration and default storage setting. And because of that, every change that we do in IP tables need to flush out all the old rules and need to read the new rules. And this is the reason why that system has to reboot every time. But this is not the case with firewall D as we just modify or apply the new or existing rule. Then in terms of additional feature, well, both IP tables and firewall D are designed for the same purpose. But the only difference being the interface with which the tasks are done. And there is one more notable concept or feature in firewall D and that is network zone. And this feature allows the administrator to separate the network into different zones based on the level of trust that has been placed on the users and the devices in each zone. So this was a brief comparison of Firewall D with IP tables. And at the end, if I say that Firewall D is way ahead to the IP tables, it wouldn't be wrong. And that also brings me to the end of this particular video. I'll see you in the next video.
In this video, we are going to talk about packet flow via firewall D. While the place or the interface from where the packet gets released or gets exit is called as egress and the interface receiving it called as ingress. And both of these are interfaces. And with the help of these two interfaces, we can easily understand the phenomena of packet flow through any device. A switch supports the firewall D filters and it let us control the flow of the data packet. Data packets get transferred from the switch as they get forwarded from source to destination. We have another type of packets known as local packets and they get sent or received by the routing engine and they do not get to transit the switch. In local packets, we have information about the routing protocol data and data for the telnet, SSH, etc. services. And not only that, local packets also get to have the information about routing process and routing source and destination. Firewall filters on ingress influence the flow of the data packets that gets received on the switch interface. Upon receiving the data packets, packet forwarding engine in the system determines the destination of the packets by looking at the information in the forwarding table for the best and optimum route from source to destination. From this end, the packets gets to the egress end. And as mentioned earlier that with the help of packet forwarding engine we get to know about the destination from the source and then on the egress end that is the end to receive the packets the firewall d filters employs and influence the packets that are sent by the switch and not those sent through or by the routing engine and this type of filter that gets used to decide what packets to filter and what not gets applied by the packet forwarding engine on the egress interface. So this is how packet transfer gets happened through firewall D with the help of switch and on the egress and ingress ends. And that was all about the packet transfer via firewall D. And that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we are going to talk about Samba overview features and working. While well, Samba is a very popular freeware program that you can configure own your any of the Linux distribution and it also allows you to share and access different resources like printers, files and directories on the intranet of any organization or over the internet. It is also referred to as the network file system. Samba is based on the client server protocol of SMB that is also known as server message block and CIFS. We talked in detail in CIFS in the previous videos. With the help of any software that has the support of SMB and CIFS, you can send the series of requests to the Samba server that resides on other system in order to access different resources. On the other hand, the Samba server is responsible to give response to each request that have been made by the client. One of the greatest feature of Samba is it allows the Windows and Unix system coexist in the same network. So how cool it would be that you can use same resources from your Windows operating system and Unix and Linux operating systems as well. If you do not want to pay for the Windows server, but still you want to have a system or a solution where you can have the file sharing and printer facilities, Samba is the solution for you. And let's say if you want to share a printer and data among the Windows and Unix system using the intranet or over the internet, Samba will help you out here as well. And if you want to have single database for the user account that work on both Windows and Unix system and you want to integrate the Unix and Windows authentication, Samba is the solution for you. Now I'll show you that how you can install and set up Samba in Ubuntu operating system. First of all, what you need to do, you need to update your system. So I'll write here sudo apt update, hit enter. Give it your password, hit enter once again, and it will update our system. After that, right here sudo apt install space samba and hit enter. Press Y, hit enter once again. It will take a little bit of time. We are done here. Now let me clear my terminal. And here I'll write where is samba. It will return you the directory where we have installed it. After you are done with the installation of Samba, now it's time to set it up. So first of all, what we need to do, we need to create a directory. So I'll write here mkdir, I'll give it a space, slash home, 
slash my username and after that you can name your directory anything i'll name it as samba folder hit enter so as we are done with the creation of our directory now there is a configuration file of samba and that is located in sudo space nano which is a text editor give it a space etc slash samba and in here we have the file and name of the file is smb.con hit enter this is the file that i was talking to you about well at the bottom of it if i scroll down so add these line into your configuration file as comment equals samba on ubuntu this is the path of the directory that we have created read only no browsable yes after that we need to save the changes so i'll press ctrl x i'll press y and hit enter and we are out of it let me clear my terminal and as we are done so now what we need to do we need to restart our samba so i'll write here sudo service smbd space restart and hit enter and now we need to add a rule into our firewall and we need to allow samba traffic the command for that is sudo space ufw ufw stands for ubuntu firewall and that i have already installed after that right here allow space samba and hit enter we are done here as it says rule added let me clear my terminal and we are good to go so we are done with everything and that was all about the overview feature and working of samba in the next video i'll show you some of the examples that how samba were till then take care in this video i'll talk about that how to configure samba to provide the network share to client so basically what i'll do i'll configure my samba and i'll create a folder in that and i'll also show you that how you can access that shared folder from other machine or other machine i'll use linux mint the first thing that we need to do into our ubuntu is to update it and then install samba so i'll write here sudo apt space update hit enter after the update now we need to install samba so i'll write here sudo apt install samba hit enter i have already done that so just use this command in order to install samba into your linux distribution and you are good to go after you are done with this step now we need to enable it as well so i'll write here sudo space system ctl space enable space hyphen hyphen now space smbd hit enter this will enable samba into our system now here i'll create a directory that i'm going to make a shareable so for that purpose I'll write here mkdir space write the name of the directory that you want to share I'll name it as share underscore folder hit enter this will be into my home directory or root directory so if I write here ls space hyphen l hit enter here you can see we have a folder as share folder that we have just created samba has its own database for adding different users and their account now we need to create a user so for that purpose i'll write here sudo space smb pa double swd space hyphen a space write the name of the user that you want to create i'll name this user as david hit enter and now here we need to provide the password so i'll write the password and hit enter here it says added user david let me clear my terminal and now we need to edit the configuration file for our samba so i'll write here sudo nano space slash etc slash samba slash samba.conf or smb.conf hit enter come to the bottom of this particular file to do so either you can scroll down or you can keep pressing ctrl v after that right here this share underscore folder which is the folder that i'm going to share then this is the path read only means no and valid user is david it means only with the username david will be able to access this folder after that press ctrl x press y to save changes hit enter now what we need to do we need to restart our samba so for that i'll write here sudo space system ctl space restart space smbd hit enter it will restart our service we are done with this one as well now here we need to know or we need to find out about our ip address because only then we'll be able to access the shared folder 
so for that i'll write here i have config hit enter so at the moment this is my ip address which is 192.168.111.131 we are done with everything in our ubuntu and now i will head to my linux mint and i'll access this folder so this is my linux mint and here first of all we need to install the smb client so for that i'll write here sudo apt space install space smb client space cifs hyphen utils because with the help of cifs i'll access that folder hit enter give it password hit enter once again i have already installed this one as well and now if i go to my mnt folder so for that i'll write here ls space hyphen l space slash mnt here if you see we do not have any folder with the name of share underscore folder it means we do not have access to that particular folder to access that folder we have to write some commands so first of all i'll write here mount space hyphen t space cifs space slash double slash and now write the ip address and that was 192.168 .111.131 after that again give it a slash and write the name of the folder which was share underscore folder so basically this is the path that i'm going to access and now i have to write the username so if you remember in our case username was david so first of all here we'll use a flag as hyphen o then give it a space right here username equals david Again, give it a space and write the path. Where do you want to access this folder? I want to access this one into my MNT directory. We are done with everything. Now what we need to do, we need to just hit enter. Okay, here it says permission denied. So for that purpose, we have to use sudo command. And now if I hit enter, we'll be able to access that particular folder. And then I'll show you from the user interface as well. Give it your password, hit enter once again. And now let's head to our MNT folder call so right here cd slash MNT hit enter and if I ls hyphen l here here you can see we do have a folder with the name share underscore folder now now let me go to my file explorer and I'll show it to you from there as well I'll go to my file system here is MNT and here we have share underscore folder so anything that you will create in here you will make in here for example directories file different other things you can access them from your ubuntu or anything that you put in this folder from ubuntu you can access all of that from here as well so this is how you can configure your samba and that brings me to the end of this video i'll see you in the next one in this video we'll talk about how we can configure the mail server well i'll show you that how you can do that into the linux mint or ubuntu or any other linux distribution first of all i'll update my system so I write here sudo apt update hit enter we are done here and now I'll install bind 9 the command for that is sudo apt install space bind 9 hit enter it will take a little bit of time so do not worry press y hit enter once again we are done here with the installation and now we need to know about our IP address so for that you can write here IP config hit enter so this is my IP address that ends with 134 after that what we need to do we need to edit a configuration file so i'll write here sudo space nano space slash war slash cache slash bind slash db dot test after that hit enter this is the file and here we'll add some of the code in here so add these line into this particular file and make sure to enter your own ip address in my case, it was 192.168.111.134. After that, press Ctrl X, press Y and hit enter. Let me clear my terminal. And now we need to add a new zone to our bind configuration. So I'll use this command that says sudo named hyphen check zone space test.com space slash war slash cache slash bind slash db dot test. And if you remember, this is the same file that we edited earlier. And here it says OK. It means now we are ready to add our zone. So for that purpose, what I'll do, I'll add my zone into a file and the name is sudo nano space slash etc slash bind slash named dot 
font dot default dash zone and hit enter so this is the file and in this file i'll add a zone so come to the bottom of your file and add these line as it says zone test dot form type is equal to master and file is equal to db dot test and if you remember this was the file in which we added some of the code and this will be our domain that says test dot form press ctrl x press y and hit enter and now we need to enable the google dns so for that i'll write here sudo nano slash etc slash bind slash named dot on dot options hit enter so here if you see here we have 0 0 0 and this line has been commented what i'll do i'll change that i'll write here 8 dot 8 dot 8 dot 8 this is the dns address for the google and i'll uncomment this line now i'll press ctrl x press y to save the changes and let me clear my terminal and let's move ahead and now we need to restart our bind 9 the command for that is sudo system ctl space restart bind 9 and hit enter and we are good to go and now is the time to install an email server i will install postfix so for that i'll write here sudo apt space install space postfix hit enter this is the email server that will use to send our emails from here scroll down and hit enter from here select internet site and after that press tab and click on ok here make sure to remove this name and write your domain name and if you remember that was test.com in our case after that use your tab key go on to ok and hit enter we are done here let me clear my terminal and now we are ready to add our users first of all i'll write here sudo space user mod give it a space hyphen a capital g because this is the flag then write here mail give it a space dollar sign and in the brackets i'll write here who am i hit enter we are done this must be done because in my ubuntu only those users who are in the mail group will be able to use this utility so we have to create the users and add all of them to the mail group so that they can send and receive emails you can add as many number of users as per your liking for example let's say you are a linux administrator and there are hundred of users into your organization so you can add all those users into your mail server so for that purpose i'll write here sudo space user add give it a space hyphen m space hyphen capital g give it a space mail again give it a space hyphen s space slash bin slash bash basically this is a directory where we are going to add this user again give it a slash and give it a space and here write the name of the user that you want to create and add you can name your user anything i'll name my user as warner hit enter and here it says warning missing or non-executable shell do not worry our user have been added successfully for example if i try to run the same command again here it says warner already exists now what we need to do we need to have the password for warner so the command for that is sudo paswd or password give it a space and write here warner and hit enter have its password retype it and we are good to go now to confirm that what we have done till now is working or not we'll send an email from our terminal but for that purpose we have to install mail util so the command for that is sudo apt install mail utils and hit enter it will take around 66 megabyte of space press y hit enter once again and now we'll see if we can send the email or not so for that i'll write here mail space name of the user that we created that was warner at domain that was test.com hit enter in cc write the email address to whom you want to send this email i'll write the email address Hit enter, right here subject, I'll write here weekend plan, hit enter once again and down here start writing your email, whatever do you want to write. So I'll just add some random data, I'll hit enter, again hit enter and keep on doing that. Now press ctrl D to send your email and end your email. 
so we are done with sending our email as well and we are also done with this video so this is how you can configure your mail server into your linux distribution basically i have used linux mint process is same for the ubuntu or all the debian based linux distribution but you can do that with all the linux distribution as well i hope now that you must have liked watching this one and i'll see you in the next one hello everyone in this video we'll talk about maria db installation well first thing that we should do is to perform update on our system command for that is sudo apt update and hit enter give it your password and enter once again this command will update our system and then we'll move ahead for the installation of our maria db we are done here let me clear my terminal and here i'll write sudo apt install space mariadb's hyphen server this will install the packages that are needed for mariadb hit enter press y hit enter once again it will take a little bit of time we are done here with the installation and now we need to start the service of mariadb the command for that is sudo system ctl give it a space and right here start again give it a space right here mariadb dot service after that hit enter and we have successfully started the mariadb service let's check the status of this service so right here status instead of start and rest of the command is same now hit enter here you can see it says active and running i'll get out of this let me clear my terminal and now we need to include and install the included security script for mariadb command for that is sudo mysql underscore secure underscore installation after that hit enter here in case if you want to enter the password for root do that otherwise just hit enter i already have my root account protected so that is why i'm going to press n and hit enter and here it is asking if i want to change the root password i do not want to do that so i'll hit enter once again and here it asks me if i want to remove the anonymous users while i do not have any anonymous user into my system so that is why i'll press n in case if you have some anonymous user you can press y and hit enter i'll again press n hit enter i'll again press enter and it says reload privileges table now i'll press n and hit enter so these are some of the options that you can go with with secure installation of mariadb and you can run it as per your liking and you can customize it as per your need now let's move ahead and now let's create a user into our mariadb so i'll write here sudo mariadb hit enter and here i'll paste a command and I'll create a user here it says admin and local host identified by password with grant options this is the password of this particular user you can change it as per your liking and here we need to flush the privileges so i'll just write here flush privileges hit enter to get out of this just write here exit and hit enter once again let me clear my terminal and now let's check the version of my sql admin command for that is sudo my sql admin give it a space and right here version hit enter so here we have the version and we have all the information about the protocol version connection socket and uptime etc so this was all about that how you can install your maria db and how you can configure it that's it for this video in the next video we'll talk about some other concepts and things that are related to maria db i'll see you in the next video Hello everyone, in this video we'll talk about that how we can create a basic schema for MariaDB. First of all, I'll write here sudo space mysql space hyphen u space root space hyphen p and hit enter. Give your password and enter once again. Now in order to see all the available databases, use the command as show databases, hit enter. So these are different databases that exist into my system. Now what I'll do, I'll create a new one. Command for that is create database and write here the name that you want to give to your database i'll name it as linux underscore db semicolon hit enter and now let's see if this database has been created or not so here if you see here we have linux underscore db it means we have successfully created this one now let's go into this database command for that is use space linux underscore db semicolon hit enter now i'll create a table into this particular database command for that is create space table give it a space write the name that you want to give to your database or your table give it a space and write the name that you want to give to your 
table and I'm going to name it as employees. After that here we'll add the data. Here I'll have my opening bracket and in that I write here ID its type going to be int comma here I'll go to write name its type is going to be varchar and a limit will be 50 it means no more than 50 characters. After that again comma and here I'll write department its type is again going to be varchar and limit is going to be 50. At the end I'll have its designation so I'll write here designation and it's going to be varchar again give it a space right here 50 for the limit at the end of it i'll have my semicolon hit enter here it says query okay zero rows affected and now in order to see this table that we have just created i'll write here describe space name of the table that is employees in our case semicolon hit enter so these are the field these are the type and here we'll have the data now in order to insert the data into this particular table use the command as insert space into write the name of the table which was employees in my case give it a space right here value now in the brackets we are going to enter the value as first field is id so i'll write here 101 comma name as it's a string so i'll write here name inside the inverted commas now Again comma, for the department, I'll write here IT, for designation, I'll write here team space lead. After that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write my semicolon at the end of this command and now I'll hit enter. Here it says query ok, one row affected. Now in order to see the data that we have entered into this particular table, I'll use the command as select space static, static mean all from name of the table which is employees in my case semicolon hit enter so as you can see id is 101 name is zubair department is id designation is team lead so that was all about that how you can create a basic schema and that brings me to the end of this video i'll see you in the next one hello everyone in this video i'll show you that how we can run different queries in mariadb well first of all I'll go into my database so I'll write here sudo mysql space hyphen u space root space hyphen p hit enter enter your password and we are into our mariadb now let's see the available databases for that I'll write here show databases semicolon hit enter so these are different databases that are available I'll go into my demo database so for that I'll write here use demo semicolon and hit enter and now we are into our demo database so what i'm going to do here i'm going to describe this database or i'm going to show you what do we have in this particular database so for that purpose i'm going to write here describe space demo semicolon and hit enter okay we cannot describe the database but we can describe the tables in this one so i have a table with the name of students in this database so for that now i'll write students hit enter so this is the database these are different fields like name id class age this is the data type null these are the keys i do not have anyone i do not have any default values so basically this is a structure so basically this is a structure of my database as demo and in that this is a table now i'll show you everything that i have in this particular table so for that purpose i'm going to write here select all from students well as i have written static here static means all now if i hit enter this command will return me everything that is there into this particular table if i hit enter now so here you can see in terms of name i have these names these are the ids these are the class and these are the age of each person and now let's say you want to create a new table what can you do well for that purpose we have a command as create space table give it a space and write here the name that you want to give to your table i'll name my table as teachers give it a space and have your brackets and now inside the brackets we'll put the fields so in terms of my field i'll have different fields first of all i'll write here id then i'll define its type that is going to be int 
then I'll write here not null. It means it cannot be null whatsoever. Again, I'll give it a space. And this time I'll write here auto underscore increment. What does it mean? It means when I'll enter the data for this table, I do not have to enter the ID for every user or for every record. ID for each record will get increment on its own. Now I'll write here comma. Now I'll have second field for my table. For now, I'll just write here name and its type going to be varchar and I'll put the limit as 30 characters max and then I'll have a comma and at the end I can take one more field. For now, I'll just stick with T and its type is going to be int again and we are good to go. At the end of my line, I'll put semicolon and now if I hit enter, here we have an error because here it says there can be only one auto column and it must be defined as a key. It means we also have to make ID as our primary key. So for that, I'll use the same command that I have used earlier. And at the end of this command, I'll write here primary underscore key and inside its braces, I'll write here ID. Now we are good to go. And now let's insert the data into our teacher's table. So for that, the command is insert into, give it a space, write the name of the table. And that is teachers in my case. After that, give it a space and write here values because we are going to insert the values. For the ID, I'll not give anything in here because it is auto incremented. For the name, I'll write here, Alex, give it a comma. And then for the age, you can have the age as per your liking. So I'll write here 40. Okay, for the first record, we have to give some ID. Now let's have comma and now let's hit enter. So we have successfully added the data for the first record. And now let's see the data into the table. So I'll write here select all from teachers. Hit enter. So here we have ID, name and age. Let me clear my screen. Now let's use some of the other queries and let's see what we can do with our databases and our table. For my next queries, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go into my students table. So I'll write here, select name, comma, and I'll write here max. And inside that, I'll write here age, after that, write here from table name, which is students semicolon and now if I hit enter here it has shown me the student that has the maximum age and it has also shown me his name now if I use the same command and instead of writing here name if I write here static now if I hit enter it will show me all the data for the student that has the maximum age I can go for minimum age as well so this time I'll just write here min Instead of max, I'll write here min, hit enter. And now I have the record of the student with the minimum age. We can also go for where clause. For example, if I write here, select all from students. And here I'll have my where clause where age is less than, let's go for 24. And at the end, semicolon, hit enter. We can go for the maximum as well. Let's go for maximum this time, hit enter. We can also use OR and logical gates with our WHERE clause. Let's use that. And I'll write here AND ID is greater than 19. Now let's hit enter. So here I have the data of those students having age less than 25 and have ID greater than 19. So this is how you can extract the data as per your liking with some conditions. And that was all about how you can run different queries. And that brings me to the end of this particular video. I'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone. In this video, we'll talk about that how we can perform the backup for our database. Well, first of all, let me increase the size of my terminal so that we can have more space. And here I'll write sudo my SQL space hyphen u space root space hyphen p and hit enter and we are into our mariadb database if i write here show databases enter so these are different databases that are available into my system what i can do i can have a backup of all of them first of all what i'll do i'll exit from it let me clear my terminal and here let's say 
I am not been able to access my database or I am not been able to log in into it. Well, for that purpose, what we can do, we can have a file in which we can store our password and we can have the backup. The command for that is sudo space nano space dot my or you can name it anything dot cnf. After that, hit enter. In this file, just put the lines that I am going to put in here. First one will be large brackets and inside that right here client come to the second line and in that i write here user equal root then i'll have my password and the password is 123 in my case you will put the password that you have for your database now press ctrl x press y and hit enter to save the changes and now in case if you were not been able to access your database now you will be able to do so with the help of this file the problem will be solved and now if i ls space hyphen al here here it will show me all the files into my directory and i'm looking for the file that we have just created and that was dot my dot cnf and here is the file but here if you see for the other users and for the group the permission is read it means they will be able to read this file and they can know my password so for that purpose what should i do i should change the permission so for that i'll write here chmod but before that let's write here sudo space chmod and now i'll write here 600 or you can also go for 700 give it a space write the name of the file that is my.cnf hit enter now let's use the same command and let's see what are the permissions now for the file here is the file and we do not have any permission for other users and group we are done with this one and now let's move on to the next thing and now i'll use the database dump in order to have the backup for my database for that i'll use the command so simply i'll put the command in here and i'll explain it later so this is the command that i'm going to use and this will be the path where i'm going to have the backup so first of all let's create a directory in which we'll have the backup for our database so i'll press ctrl u to remove the command and this time i'll write here mkdir space slash home slash username slash desktop and in here i'll create a new directory and i'll name it as backup hit enter so here if you see we have a new directory or a folder onto our desktop with the name of backup now i'll use the same command that i was using earlier to have the backup so this is the command and onto my desktop here in the path i'll write here backup and we are good to go now so this will be the name of the file and here we'll get the date on which we'll have the backup. Now I'll just hit enter. Instead of writing exact date, I have used these commands. This command or these parameters will return me the exact and latest date. Now just hit enter. Okay, here it says command udo not found. We have to write here sudo hit enter and now we are good to go. Now if I go to my desktop, so what I'll do, I'll write here cd space slash home username desktop and I'll go to my backups folder, hit enter and now if I ls here, so here you can see here we have a file with the name of .sql.bak It means we have successfully created the backup of our database. Let me go back and here is one thing that I want to discuss here and that is if you see here, here it says add drop table databases demo at the start of the video i showed you different databases that were available into my maria db so here you will mention the name of the database that you want to backup you cannot make the backup of all the databases with this command you have to mention the name of a particular database so i've chosen demo that is why it will create the backup of my demo now i'll clear this command i'll clear my terminal and at the end i'll show you that how you can schedule a job to have the backup of your data so for that purpose i'll go into my sudo space nano slash etc slash cron tab file hit enter so here is the file and here if you see we have the information about each static here first one is for minute second for hour third for day of month then month then we have day of the week now what you can do you can select and schedule your backup as per your liking so what i'm gonna do here i'm just going to write here two space two and for the day of the month i want to have every day of the month for month 
I want every month and for day of week I want every day of the week. Then I'll write here root, I'll give it a space and here I'll paste the command that I have used earlier to create the backup. So I'll just paste that command in here. And now I'm good to go and I'll have the backup of my database on its own. So I'll just comment this line out because I do not want to do it right now. In your case, make sure to uncomment this line. Otherwise, this command will not work. After that, press Ctrl X, press Y and hit enter and you are good to go. And that also brings me to the end of this video. I'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone. In this video, we'll talk about the restore operation in MariaDB. Well, first of all, let me go to my MySQL. So I'll write here hyphen U root hyphen P. So this is my database. And if I say show databases, hit enter. So these are different databases that I have available. I'll go into my demo database. So I'll write here use demo. And if I write show tables and we have two of them. Let's drop this database. So I'll write here drop database space demo hit enter. So basically I have deleted a demo from the list and it does not exist anymore. So what I'll do here, I'll just exit from my database, hit enter. I'll clear my screen. And if you remember, we created a directory as backup onto our desktop. And in that we have this file that has the backup of our database. And we created this backup for our demo database. Now I'll show you that how you can use this particular file to insert back your demo database. Now, first of all, I'll head back into my MySQL database and in here, I'll create a table. So what I'll do now, I'll write here, create database and I'll name it as demo. Hit enter. If I write here, show databases. So here we have demo available. And if I use my demo table and if I write here, show tables, I do not have anything because I have deleted demo and at the moment I do not have any data into that one. So what I can do, I can restore the data that I had earlier in my backup and I'll insert the data from my backup file into my demo database. So first of all, let me clear my terminal and this time I'll write here sudo space my SQL space hyphen u root give it a space, write the name of the database. This is going to be demo in my case. And I'll use this angle bracket. And after that, I'll give the directory where I have my backup file. And that is onto my desktop. So that is why I'll write here a desktop. After desktop, I'll go into my backup folder. And here the name starts with slash. And this is the name of the file. So if I hit enter, we do not have any error or any message. It means our operation was successful. Now let's go to our MySQL database. So I'll write here hyphen u root hyphen p hit enter. And here if I write show databases, here we have demo. I'll write here use demo. Let me clear my screen and I'll write here show tables. So here we have two of them teachers and student. If you remember, we created these two tables in one of the previous videos. Let's open our students table. So I'll write here, describe space students, hit enter, where we have all the data that we had earlier. And this time I'll open my teachers table and let's see if we get the data that we had earlier before deletion of it or not. Hit enter. Yes, we do have data available for the teachers table as well. So this is how you can restore your data from your backup files that you had created earlier. So you might have an idea by now that why is it important to have the backup of your databases. If I have not created the backup for my database, I would not have been able to restore my database and restore the data that all I had into my demo database. So that was all about it. And this is how you can restore your data. And that brings me to the end of this video. Hello everyone. In this video, we'll talk about that how we can configure IPv6. So first of all, I'll write here IP space AWDR, hit enter. 
So basically, I want you to find out what is my IPv6 address. So this is my IPv6 address and here you will also see my IPv4 address. But as we are going to configure IPv6, we need to have this IP address. So first of all, what we need to do, we need to open a file. Command for that is sudo space nano space slash etc slash sysctl dot conf. After that, hit enter. Give it your password, hit enter once again. And in this particular file, come to the bottom and make sure to add these two line into your this file. After you are done adding these two lines, press Ctrl X, press Y to save the changes and hit enter. Let me clear my terminal. And now what we need to do, we need to go into another file. And that is sudo space nano. Instead of nano, you can use any other text editor as well. Here I'll write slash etc slash networks slash interfaces hit enter in this file we'll add some lines so these are the lines that we need to add here i need to add my ipv6 address and here i have to add my ipv6 gateway so for that purpose first of all what i'm going to do i'm going to copy my ipv6 address so here i have my ipv6 address i'll just copy that one i'll go back and in here Instead of my IPv6 address, which is right here, I'll paste that. Now it's time to go for our IPv6 gateway. Let me clear this line from here. Let me go to the new window. And here I'll use the command to find out my IPv6 gateway. The command for that is slash sbin slash route space hyphen capital A and right here INET6 hit enter. So basically, this is my gateway for IPv6. So I'll just copy that one and I'll go back and I'll paste it here. So these were some of the lines that we needed to add it into our file. Now I'll press Ctrl X, I'll press Y and hit enter. And now we are good to go. At the end, I'll just use one more command and that is sbin slash IP hyphen 6, give it a space route give it a space right here show hit enter okay here we have to give space and here you can see we have the same gateway that we needed to use earlier at the end i'll use here i have config space ens double three hit enter so here i have the same information or you can say that this command confirms that we have successfully configured our ipv6 you might be wondering that what is ENS33? Well, if you see here, we have ENS33 and in that we had our IPv4 and IPv6 address. Basically, this is the Ethernet or in your case, it might be a different thing. But make sure to use the one that you have in your system. So that is why I have used ENS33 and here I'm good to go. And now in case if you want to disable your IPv6 that you have just configured, use the command that I'm going to enter in here. This is the command. After that hit enter and here it says equal one. It means we are done. After that I'll use this command. This will also disable the default IPv6 hit enter. And again, we have the status as equal to one. This is the last one of them. And again, I'll hit enter and we are good to go. So that was all about that how you can configure IPv6 into your Ubuntu or Linux distribution. I'll see you in the next video with something new. In this video, we are going to talk about HTTP services. Well, hypertext transfer protocol often gets associated with World Wide Web and it is one of the transfer protocol that is widely used in the internet. Other than HTTP, we have SMTP, FTP, transfer protocol, etc. The HTTP describes the message that represents the request made from the client to server and then the response from server to client. Usually the request from the client is composed on the desire of some resource needed from the server and the response is generally composed of the resource provided by the server to the client and there are different methods that are associated with the HTTP and are used at the time of communication between client and server. The HTTP services are part of the application server and provides the facilities for the deployment of the web applications and websites. And those web applications and web apps are accessible by the HTTP clients. 
This facility is provided by two objects, virtual servers and HTTP listeners. A virtual server that is also known as the virtual host is the object that allows your physical servers to host more than one internet domain name and all those virtual servers that are hosted on the same physical server also have the IP address of the physical server. On the other hand, if I talk about the HTTP listeners, well each virtual server offers the connection between server and client through HTTP listener and each HTTP listener works as a listen pocket and has an IP address, port number, default virtual server and server name. So that was a brief introduction about HTTP services and that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next video. So in this video, we'll talk about getting the grub password. Well, we set the password on our grub screen or grub boot in order to have another layer of security onto our Linux distribution. Well, let's say someone knows your username and password of your Linux distribution. So he or she will be able to access your system and do anything he like. So for that purpose, what we can do, we can put the password on our grub so that only those people or only those users are able to access the system who have the privileges and have the credentials. So I'll show you that how you can set the password on your grub. First of all, let's open a terminal and in that we'll use different commands. First of all, I'll use my terminal as sudo user or you can write sudo with every command. I will have my password hit enter now first of all i'll write here nano space slash etc slash grub dot d slash 40 underscore custom well in case if you do not know what this file is just remove the nano and hit enter and here we have the information that this file provides an easy way to add custom menu entries so in this file i'll add the entries or I'll set the password. So I'll just write here a nano space hit enter. I have already entered an entry into this particular file as you can see that set super users is equal to Zubair, then password, then the username that we have set as a super user, and then its password. You can change your super user from here as well, and you can have different password in here as well. You can go with any password as per your liking. After you are done adding the entries into this particular file, press Ctrl X to get out of this, press Y and hit enter. And make sure you enter the right entries as here it says super users not the user singular. Now hit enter and now we need to update our grub. So I'll write here update hyphen grub and hit enter. It will update the entries into the grub file. So we'll wait for it. As you can see, it says done. Now I'll reboot my system to see if the changes has taken place or not. To reboot your system, either you can write here reboot, you can write here init space six, or you can reboot your system from the power option menu. So after that, I'll just hit enter and I'll reboot my system. So here you can see on our grub, it is asking us about the username. So I'll enter my username, which was super if you remember. And here I'll have my password hit enter. Now it will allow us to boot into our Ubuntu distribution. Let's wait for it and there is something more that I want to discuss with you. So we are back into the system so let's open our terminal once again and here is one more thing and that is let's say someone was able to access your system and somehow they were able to access that file in which you had your user and password. So what we can do we can change that particular password with the hash value how we can do that so for that purpose let me go back to sudo su hit enter and here i'll use a command as grub hyphen mkpawd which is make password hyphen pbkdf2 hit enter give it your password hit enter once again so here if you see this is the hash value for our grab password so what you can do, you can copy this particular path that starts from grub.pbkdf2.sha. Just copy this path and now we'll go back to the grub file. So I'll use the command as nano slash etc slash grub.t slash 40 underscore custom. I'll hit enter. So here instead of writing here password zubair abc, 
I'll replace it. Let me just clear that first. So I'll just remove everything from here. And now I'll paste the hash value that I copied earlier. So this is the hash value. Now anyone who even has access to this particular file will not be able to know what the password is because we have replaced it with the hash value. So this is another layer of security for your grub. So how cool and how easy it is. And that brings me to the end of this particular video. I'll see you in the next one. In this video, we'll talk about setting the root password for single user mod from grub page. So as I'm using my Ubuntu 22.04, so first of all, I'll restart my Ubuntu so that I can go to my boot screen or you can say grub screen. So I'll just click on restart and I'll click on restart from here. If you doesn't get your boot up menu, keep pressing your shift key. It will show you your grub menu just like this one. Make sure you are onto your Ubuntu and after that down here, we have some commands. To edit some of the entries, we have to press E. So I'll press E. So here I have a password for my grub. I'll just enter my username and I'll have my password. And now from here, scroll down here, look for the line that says Linux. And after that, it starts with slash boot slash VM liners and ends at underscore hand off. Make sure to get at the end of this line and start deleting last pad until you get to the RO. From here, instead of RO right here, RW, basically it's a permission that says read write. Then init equals slash bin slash bash. After that, press Ctrl X to get out of this mode. Now it will get you to your root. From here, we have to execute some of the commands in order to reset the password. So let's wait for it. So here we are onto our root and here what I'm going to write, I'm going to write here PASSWD space root, hit enter and here we'll give the new password. I'll write here my password, enter. Okay, here we have two choices. Either we can keep anything or it is recommended to have password at least eight characters long. So that is why my password did not match. So I'll just enter my password. I'll not worry about having password less than eight characters. I'll re-enter my password and it says password updated successfully. After this one, we have to execute one more command in order to make sure that all these changes take place. And that is execute, which is exec space slash sbin again slash init and hit enter. It will run some of the commands. Do not worry. We are done with everything and now we need to reboot our system. So here you can see our system has been rebooted and now I'll just enter my password. Hit enter and here we are back into our Ubuntu and we have successfully set the password for our root single user. And that brings me to the end of this video. In this video, we'll talk about how we can configure systems to mount the file system at boot by UUID or label. So first of all, I'll write here LSBLK, which is list block, hit enter. So here we have partition as SDA1, SDA2, SDA3, and then we have a mother partition as SDB. Now I'll write here sudo space BLKID, which is block ID. Now I'll use a pipe as grep space hyphen B space loop, hit enter. So here if you see for SDA2 and SDA3, we have UUID. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a directory into my system. The command for that is sudo space mkdir space and I'll create a directory into my var directory. And here I'll name my directory as dir1 and I'll hit enter. So what I'll do, I'll copy the UUID of my sda3. I'll just copy that one. I'll right click on it. And now I'll go to a file as sudo space nano space slash etc slash fs tab. Hit enter. Here we need to enter a line or add a line. So first of all, paste the UUID that you had just copied. After that, there is something extra that we need to add. And that is we need to write the path of the directory that we have created and where we want to mount it. And that was dir1. And after that here, I have written ext4, which means the file system and default than these two other parameters. After that, press Ctrl X, press Y to save the changes and hit enter. Now we need to reboot our system so that the changes can take place. So I'll write here, reboot, hit enter. I'll see you after the reboot. 
So we are back with the reboot of our system and let me open my terminal once again. This time again I'll load lsblk hit enter. Now if you see SDA3 has been mounted onto our var slash dir1 directory means with the uuid we have done it successfully. Let me clear my terminal and let's move ahead and do that with the label. First of all we need to assign a label to our directory. I'll use a command and I'll explain it to you. This is the command and this command will assign a label to our directory. I'm going to do that for SDA3 again. And this time here if you see I have given it a label as data. Now I'll hit enter. I'll give it my password hit enter once again. Now if I write here lsplk hit enter. We have a directory SDA3 here. And now what we need to do. We need to use the same command that we used earlier as sudo space blk id lock id. Now here I'll use a pipe as greps space hyphen v space loop hit enter. And now here we have a label available for SDA3. And now with the help of this label we'll mount this particular partition. First of all let me clear my terminal. And here I'll create a new directory. So I'll write here sudo mkdir space. And here you can name your directory anything. And I'll name this directory as war2 hit enter. Now what we need to do, we need to again open our fs tab. So for that sudo space nano space slash etc slash fs tab hit enter. And here we have to add a line just like we did earlier. So this is the line that we needed to add it because label is data if you remember. The label of my partition was data. And then here this is the directory where I'm going to mount it. This is the file type. Then here we have some other arguments in here. Now again we need to press Ctrl X, press Y to save the changes and hit enter. So we are done with everything that was needed to be done and again we just need to reboot our system so that these changes can take place at the boot time. So I'll just write here reboot and I'm good to go. And that brings me to the end of this video as well. I'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone. In this video we'll talk about how to delete partitions on MBR and GPT disk. First of all, I'll write a command into my Linux terminal as sudo space gdisk space hyphen l space slash dev slash sda hit enter. Well, sda is the name of my disk. And here if you see my disk is of type gpt. In case if it was mbr, here you would have seen present written. But as it is present in front of GPT, it means my disk is GPT type. And in case if you do not know what your disk name is, do not worry, use the command as lsblk and hit enter. Here you have your disk and here is the name as sda. And these are different partitions into this one. First of all, I'll show you that how you can create a partition into gdisk type or GPT type and how you can delete them then. So first of all, I'll write here gdisk space slash dev slash name of the disk in which you want to create a partition. So as the name of my partition is sda, so I'll hit enter. Here it says you must run this program as root. So I'll use the same command, but this time I'll use sudo along with it as well. Hit enter. Here it is asking for the command. I'll put n in here as I'm going to create a new partition. After that, I'll hit enter and here it is asking us about the partition number. Default is 4 because 3 are already there. So I'll press 4, hit enter. And here it is asking about the first sector. If you do not know about anything here, do not worry, just hit enter. And now here we need to provide the size for our new partition. I'll give it as plus 100 M. It means 100 megabyte, hit enter. Again, hit enter and we are good to go here it is asking us about hex code or guid if you do not know about anything again leave it as it is and press enter and now in order to save the changes or write the changes i'll press w and i will hit enter here it is asking do you want to proceed yes i'm sure so i'll press y and hit enter okay the only difference between creating and deleting different partitions in gpt and MBR disk type is that with GPT, it asks you about one sanity check. With MBR disk type, it doesn't do anything like that. Now, I'll show you that how you can delete partition on 
gpt disk type so i'll use the same command as gdisk space slash dev slash sda hit enter okay again i have to use root so i'll write here sudo space hit enter and here as i'm going to delete the partition so i'll press d hit enter partition number i want to delete partition number four i'll press four and again i'll hit enter to write the changes i'll press w and hit enter once again i'll press y to confirm it and hit enter now i'll write here ls blk and hit enter so here if you see now we have only three partitions the one that we created with the name sda4 have been deleted successfully and now i'll show you that how you can delete partition from mbr disk type the command for that is fdisk earlier we were using gdisk now we'll use fdisk give it a space slash dev slash sda hit enter okay again i have to use sudo hit enter and here again i'll press n and hit enter partition number default is 4 because 3 are already there and here it is asking us about the first sector just leave it as it is and hit enter for the size here i'll write here plus 100 m and hit enter okay it says value out of range not worry just hit enter and here we have successfully created the partition 4 with 1 megabyte in size now in order to write the changes i'll press w and hit enter okay here if you are worried about this particular thing do not worry i'm just showing you the way that how you can delete and create different partitions if there is a problem i'll look into that okay now just press w and hit enter to write the changes let me clear my terminal now if i write here ls blk hit enter here you can see now we have four partitions this one is sda4 with around one megabyte in size now i'll show you that how you can delete your partition the command is sudo space fdisk space slash dev slash sda hit enter as we are going to delete it press t hit enter once again i'm going to delete partition 4 so press 4 hit enter press w to write the changes and if i write here ls blk here we do not have partition 4 available so this is how you can delete your partitions on your mbr and gpt disk type and that also brings me to the end of this particular video